Back in his initial introduction, Bardock had a pretty interesting ability, the ability of foresight, a blessing and a curse. And I've seen a pretty popular suggestion a lot here. What would have happened if Goku and Raditz had that ability too? Well, unfortunately, it's kinda tough to make that work. But I think I found a way to make it actually happen. We'll be discussing how it happens and the consequences of it. And seeing how it affects the series and this brand new story, what if Goku had Bardock's foresight? Oh yeah, and what if Raditz had the foresight too? We'll set a like goal of 5,000 likes. And if we hit that, I'll continue this into a full series. So our story begins trying to explain how this even occurs. Bardock originally got his foresight after the fact, after Goku and Raditz were born. It wasn't anything genetic either. It was activated during battle, so we can't say Goku and Raditz were born with it because that doesn't work. Although, I have an idea of how to make it work. Surprisingly, both Dragon Ball Super Bardock and Dragon Ball Z Bardock can be pieced together pretty easily. You will have to change a few things around for both of them, but you can make it work, without taking too much of a creative liberty. And now you're probably wondering, why are you combining the two Bardocks? Well, we need Z Bardock because he's the one who has that ability, but we need Super Bardock for another reason. He has the same encounter with the heaters that he initially did, on Planet Siri. And here, Manido ends up making a wish for Bardock, asking for his two sons to thrive. This part of Bardock's story doesn't change. Immediately after, he heads back home. And this is some more minus stuff. This is when he sends Kakarot away. And then after that, he'll have the same encounter he did with his squad, being sent out on a mission where they die, and he gets his foresight. As far as we know right now, this hasn't happened in canon. Although, I am recording this in November, and knowing Dragon Ball Super, they always introduce stuff after the fact, so when I record something, it's immediately outdated, so I don't know, maybe they will introduce this. But jokes aside though, we haven't seen this yet. And including this isn't really too outlandish. The biggest change here is that Bardock's already suspicious of Frieza beforehand, having heard it from the heaters, but he has to go on this mission. He can't act suspicious. It's all to protect Kakarot, draw the attention away from him. And this isn't really changing too much of canon either because his squad does exist in both versions of the story. It's kind of just changing the order of events here. But the two important things are, Monado made a wish for his sons to thrive, and Bardock was able to get his foresight. For the events leading up to his death, we'll follow the events of Bardock, Father of Goku, which is the original introduction for him. Although it kind of does line up with Minus because he ended up fighting Frieza there too, or attempting to, and this leads us to his death. Bardock watches, Frieza's attack barrels towards the planet. He tries to attack, fighting back with his own blast, but of course it does nothing, and Bardock ends up being one of the first casualties of it, being consumed by Frieza's attack, dying from it. Although, before he dies, something strange happens. He sees a vision, or two actually. One vision is Frieza, looking different than before, facing down two figures. He can't really make them out, but their hairstyles, it's unmistakable. Are these adult versions of Kakarot and Raditz? He's not sure, because before they turn around, another vision appears. He sees a dragon. He's not sure what it is, but it's Taranba. Bardock looks around him. He's in nothingness, just a blank space, a place between Otherworld and the living world. It's a strange vision, and he's not even sure if this is a vision. Taranbo talks to Bardock. Monaito made a wish for Bardock's sons to thrive, actually going through with it and making the wish. And Bardock's surprised. He didn't realize Monaito actually did make a wish for that. And Taranbo explains. He can ensure that his sons will grow up and thrive, but only up to a certain point. Although, he'll make a bargain with Bardock if he'd like. That power of his, that foresight, the blessing and the curse. He can grant that power to his two sons, further protecting them, beyond the point where they're grown. And it is a gamble because in Bardock's eyes, there's downsides with it. But from what he saw, there was that vision where they were facing Frieza, or at least that's what he assumed was happening. And he thinks on it, but he realizes there's only one right choice here. He already saw what's going to happen, or at least part of it. So whatever choice he goes with here, he knows it'll turn out well. He goes with his gut. He accepts the bargain. Grant this power to Kakarot and Raditz. Taranbo acknowledges this very well. A light flashes, and Bardock's life ends. Frieza floats there, watching over the planet exploding. He looks on triumphantly, but little does he know, he might have just created one of his worst nightmares. And as Barak is sent to Otherworld, he wonders if he made the right choice. That foresight allows him to see bad things that would happen. Theoretically, it should protect them, right? But could it also make them more paranoid and cause things to happen that weren't supposed to? He's not too sure. It's a conundrum, a double-edged sword that we'll be exploring throughout this series. And there we have our explanation. It's a little strange, but I didn't need to take too many liberties with it. Honestly, it's a very interesting concept, so I wanted to do whatever was possible to make it happen. I also considered just having it activate when Kakarot hit his head, but I did it this way specifically to have Raditz have it too. And we'll be seeing how it plays out for both of them. Goku, the pure-hearted one, and Raditz, the evil one of his sons. What will this change about their lives, though? Well, at first, not really too much. Let's start by covering Goku. On Earth, he doesn't really encounter too much danger at first. He's already strong to begin with. But there is a drawback here. Him hitting his head actually kind of delays the effects of this. Kakarot had the ability of foresight, but once he hit his head, it made it more dormant, and he doesn't immediately develop the power. Bardock's foresight was activated in the part of his brain after all, and if Goku's getting damage to his brain, that has a negative effect here. Goku does have visions occasionally, but never really thinks much of them. They're few and far between, and they're always very brief. They only really ever occur in his dreams too, 
never occurring while he's conscious. And he just chalks it up to coincidences, having dreams about something happening and then it kinda does happen. Like, one of his reoccurring dreams is one of a giant monkey. But then he also has other dreams, like he's fighting against a guy with three eyes. And soon after that dream, he has another one about some green monster. He thinks nothing of this as he heads into the 22nd World Tournament. The dreams didn't even explain anything, they were just there. But after this, he begins paying more attention. That dream, it warned him of King Piccolo. While training with Kami, there's another one that occurs. He sees Piccolo again, in different attire, and he brings this up to Kami too. Telling him about the dreams that he's had before as well, and Kami's confused. He had a dream that he would fight King Piccolo, and then had a dream about his reincarnation? Well, he asks, has he heard a story about Piccolo before at all? Goku's not too sure, and Kami wonders what this is. He knows Goku's a strange kid, but he can't really have an ability like this, can he? Being able to predict events with his dreams? It's gotta be a coincidence. Maybe it's just stories he's heard appearing in his subconscious, but slowly, the dreams start getting more frequent. And it's nothing crazy, he'll just see people. By the time the 23rd World Tournament rolls around, he knows exactly what Piccolo Jr. looks like, expecting him to show up there. And this is where you start to see that it's really strange. Like, dreaming of Piccolo's reincarnation, I mean, he kinda knew about that already. And his appearance, it's not too hard to guess. But the fact that everything was right about his appearance, down to the clothes he was wearing, that's too much of a coincidence. He also dreamt that he saw Mercenary Tao at this tournament as a cyborg, and that he would meet Chi-Chi again here. And this time he actually knows who she is because of that. And the dreams stop for a while. After the 23rd World Tournament during the short time skip, in his dreams, he sees a man. He has strange armor on, he has long hair, and he's sticking a hand out. Goku tries to have this vision again, but he can't. It just appears once, and he's not sure what's going on. This, of course, is Raditz. But what's going on with him? Raditz is a stronger warrior. He can't control his foresight, but it has helped him in battle many times before. Unlike Goku's, he never lost his because he never hit his head. His foresight actually activates very frequently, also because he faces way more danger than Goku did. This leads to him becoming an expert strategist, becoming a much better fighter too. Vegeta and Nappa, they respect this ability. They don't know his exact ability because Raditz kind of keeps it to himself. He never reveals it, wondering what this intuition is, but Vegeta and Nappa just see it as him having a very high battle IQ, being smart enough to always see multiple steps ahead. And it's not just that, he is stronger than before. Very slightly though, he gets to engage in tougher battles because he knows how to actually work around them, and it leads to this. He's also more level-headed too, and a little bit more reserved than the other Saiyans. He has no clue what this gift of his is, but at this point, he recognizes that. These occasional visions that he sees, they always help him, keep him away from danger. Although, now the two of them are fully grown. Taranbo's protection is done. He fulfilled the wish, protecting them, allowing them to grow up and thrive. But even though he's no longer protecting them from harm, the foresight remains. A gift from Bardock that they don't even realize is there. Of course, the Saiyans realize that one day, they're going to need another Saiyan in the crew. And Raditz has the perfect idea. His brother, Kakarot, he's on Earth. He can go find his brother and recruit him. Naturally, he's the one sent there to do this. And on a space pod on the way to Earth, he actually has a strange vision. And this one's weird, because he's not supposed to be at Earth for a while. So far, his visions have been very near future. But this one, it's seeing months out. And it's a gruesome vision. He briefly sees Kakarot's face. But he's looking up at Kakarot. He's on the ground, dying. He's bleeding out. And Kakarot's looking down at him. The vision ends, and Raditz is panicked. What? Wait, he's gonna die here? He tries to focus, trying to get that thing to activate again. But no matter what he does, it doesn't work. He saw that brief glimpse of that vision, and he also saw Kakarot holding onto his tail as a beam of light approached him. But it ended there, and Raditz sees now. He's gonna die here. This encounter, it's gonna kill him. Or at least, that's what it's supposed to do. Maybe he can avoid it. These visions he's had, they've always helped protect him from harm. But he's never had one like this where the outcome seems so set in stone. Maybe he actually needs to tread carefully here. Maybe they're underestimating Kakarot, and if Kakarot doesn't want to join them, well, if Raditz wants to live, he shouldn't get into a battle with him. But then something hits Raditz. He never even realized it before. Wait, if he has this ability, maybe Kakarot has it too. Maybe that's a way that he's able to kill Raditz in the future. Raditz obviously doesn't know how this ability came to be. What if it's genetic or something? He doesn't know. And if Kakarot has an ally, no matter how weak Kakarot is, the two of them could work to defeat Raditz. Kakarot would know a way to do so. And surprisingly enough, Raditz sees another vision soon after realizing this. He sees Frieza, transformed. It's definitely Frieza. He looks different than before. He wasn't even aware that Frieza could turn into this. But he turns to his side. Beside him, it's Kakarot, nodding at Raditz. Both are a little worn out. He can see a little battle damage, but they're ready to fight. And the vision ends, and Raditz realizes what's happening here. But it makes no sense. He had a vision where he was going to die, and now he's having one where he's facing Frieza with Kakarot? And the weirdest part is, this is the farthest vision that he's had. All the others were short term. Hell, even the one where he just died against Kakarot, that was only a few months out. But this one, he has no frame of reference. It's gotta be beyond that. But a shocking realization hits him. That other vision, where they're facing Frieza together. That's because he's gonna change the outcome. He's gonna change his story. It's not gonna end against Kakarot. No, a new story's gonna begin when he meets Kakarot. He could change the outcome of it. He doesn't need to die against Kakarot. 
he can go much further beyond that, and he's never had the visions work like this. His attack ball barrels through space, getting closer to Earth, and before he knows it, he lands there. As he steps foot on this planet, he has another vision. It's Kakarot, standing there. And Raditz is seeing from his point of view, he sees his hand outstretched towards Kakarot. You can see that he's a bit reluctant, but all he sees is that he's looking at Kakarot. And this vision, it's not far in the future like those other two that he had. This vision, it's from later today. Actually, maybe a few minutes from now. Damn it, what's going on with him? He looks on his scouter, seeing a couple power levels. He only wants to find Kakarot. He goes to the first one he sees, with that being Piccolo. And as Raditz lands, he recognizes this man. He saw him far away. In one of his visions where he was dying against Kakarot, he saw him, Piccolo. This guy's standing there, this Namekian. And Raditz knows he needs to be careful. If he plays his cards right, he could live. But he also knows that if he plays them wrong, he'll die here. This will be his last day living. And remember, Raditz is a lot more reserved here, more level-headed. He still has an evil say, but he's going to be smarter about his choice of words and how he acts here, especially with the visions helping him. So instead of even picking a fight with Piccolo, he asks, where's Kakarot? Piccolo has no clue who he's talking about. And Piccolo's very combative, but Raditz can't go any further than this. He is getting pissed though, annoyed that he doesn't get the info that he wants. He tells Piccolo he's looking for another Saiyan warrior. How is this planet even still alive? Kakarot should have wiped it out by now. And Piccolo has no clue what he's talking about. Okay, well, he could describe Kakarot. He remembers seeing him in an orange outfit with a blue shirt on him, with some symbol on his chest. Obviously, Kakarot might not even be wearing that right now, but it's worth a shot asking. And Piccolo immediately knows who he's talking about. Goku? Raditz has no clue who this Goku is. But suddenly, his scouter goes off. It detects another high power level far away. And then Piccolo looks in the same direction. That is where Goku's power is coming from. And Raditz doesn't say anything. He immediately heads off going over there. What is he doing? He feels like a coward. He could have been more aggressive, getting the info that way. That Namekian was no trouble. He shouldn't be scared of him. Just because he saw a vision where he might have died against Piccolo doesn't mean that it was actually going to happen. He shouldn't have been so cowardly about it. He trusts his visions though, and he knows that they keep him away from harm, but for some reason he was so cowardly this time around, and he doesn't know why. What's going on with him? There's a reunion at Kame House, and Goku's feeling a little bit strange. That vision that he had before, the man with the long hair and the armor, from what he remembers, he met him here at Kame House, and this is the first time he's been here since he had that vision. He tells Roshi about this too, saying that he's had these visions before and he's told Kami about it. And Roshi has no clue of what to think, but did the vision have anything bad in it? And Goku has no clue, he just remembers meeting somebody here. He still doesn't know if these visions are even true or not, and Roshi says he just might be overthinking it. But still, the fact that he foresaw Piccolo, hell even Tenshinha, and that great ape thing, he's seen things before they've happened, even if they've been vague before. But then he senses a power approaching. And this confirms it for him. This has to be it. That man that he saw. Raditz lands on the island, intimidating everybody. But he's not immediately aggressive. He just stands there as Goku comes outside a Kame house. His eyes widen as he sees Raditz, with Raditz having the same reaction. The two lock eyes. And then at the same time, they both see that same vision. The one of them encountering each other. As they stare each other down, Krillin asks what's wrong. And Goku says he doesn't know. He doesn't think anything's wrong. At least not yet. He just had some sort of vision, some hallucination. The same one he had before, but... This is the first time that it happened while he was conscious. And it's the same one that he saw beforehand. And Raditz is intrigued to hear this. So he does have them too. Wait, what? Raditz walks closer to him. He asks Goku, has he had any of these before? Well, Goku says he's had weird dreams where he sees things that eventually happen, but it's rare, few and far in between. And Raditz tells Goku, he has a gift, they both do. He's had the same visions. And Goku asks, who is he? Why do they both have this? And Raditz explains, he's Goku's brother. They're aliens, say it. But he finds it interesting. Kakarot doesn't have these visions like Raditz does. But also, the fact that he goes by Goku and not Kakarot. Doesn't he remember his name? Well, not actually. He doesn't know anything about his past. And Raditz inquires, did he hit his head or something? And that's exactly what happened. And Raditz theorizes, well, that explains the memory loss, but possibly also why his visions don't work the same as Raditz. But he does have them, so it is between them. Maybe it's genetic or something. They don't know. Maybe hitting his head is why this divination is latent for him. He clearly has it, but not to Raditz's level. And Goku tells Raditz, he's seen him before, in a vision a while ago, a dream. And Roshi's amazed, it's true. He saw the future just like Baba could do. And Bulma asks if this is new, but Goku says no. He goes into more detail about it. He just never realized. First, it was a coincidence, but then things started lining up too weirdly, especially when he first met Piccolo Jr. But that leads Goku to his next question. Why is Raditz here after all this time? What brought him here to Earth? Why did he want to find Goku? And Raditz almost says that he needs Kakarot to help him take over a planet, but changes. He knows their true motive, and knows what they really need to do down the line. He goes with his vision, the one that he saw before. He needs Kakarot to help him defeat Frieza, explaining who Frieza is, and how he saw a vision of them defeating him together, fighting against him, causing him to use his full power even. The two have latent power far beyond where they realize, and Raditz thinks that maybe together, 
the two of them can unlock that string. He sticks a hand out, reluctantly. That vision is fulfilled, and Goku remembers seeing this exact thing, and he was thinking whether he would take this guy's hand or not, but now that he knows who he is, in the context of it, nervously, he shakes Raditz' hand. And Raditz is just as nervous. He chuckles too. What a huge change of plans. But if his visions led him to this, this is how he could survive. And normally no one would be sure about this. I mean, an alien showing up telling Goku he's his brother? But Goku's visions tell him that this is the correct choice. Kakar thinks this might be fate, but Raditz sees it as something different. This is him changing fate. His visions, they're not set in stone. They're something that could be changed. He could alter the future. He could prevent things from happening. And don't mistake this for Raditz being good. They just have a common goal. Survive and fulfill their visions, learning more about them. And Raditz's personal goal is to defeat Frieza, with Goku also jumping on board that, excited to fight a guy that's supposedly that strong. And Raditz looks over at Gohan too, wondering how strong a hybrid could be. And he looks around at the rest of them, recognizing how truly weak everyone is in comparison to him. He's still not sure if this is going to work, but his visions haven't been wrong yet. Maybe this could actually work. The group isn't really sure whether to trust Raditz or not. This all seems a little suspicious, but Goku, for some reason, he feels like this is right. This is something that he can do, and they can actually trust Raditz's judgment here because Goku's seeing the same exact things. He could tell Raditz obviously isn't a good person, but the important thing is, he's not here as a threat, and actually may be able to help Goku a bit. Apparently, Raditz wants to train him up too. Help him grow stronger. Goku's up for the challenge of fighting Frieza, whoever he is, and also growing stronger too. He's definitely not going to turn that down. If Raditz truly was here for nefarious purposes, he would have killed them by now. And as for Raditz, he's still conflicted himself. He's partially annoyed that he has to take this route, not expecting that he would change his mind and actually try to team up with these Earthlings, rather than trying to recruit Kakarot by force. But again, he does trust his visions over anyone else. They have saved him before, and if this is the way that he's going to judge situations, then so be it. It may not seem ideal, but he knows deep down that it is ideal. This way, he can preserve his life. That's all that really matters to him. It's selfish, but inadvertently does help Goku and the others. Whatever path allows him to survive the longest and defeat Frieza. Thankfully though, this does lead to having a better first impression with Goku. Instead of Goku actually hating his brother for trying to kidnap his son, Raditz has a much better first impression, and Goku's intrigued to learn more about him. Again, this doesn't mean Raditz is good at all. He's just having a better introduction and different motives. But he has no clue where to start with his brother Kakarot, or Goku, whatever the hell his name is. Even just from the name, he could tell. Kakarot's been raised as an Earthling. He doesn't have all the benefits that Saiyans had when they were growing up in training. One thing here is also the fact that Earth's gravity is way weaker than Planet Vegeta's. He wonders how they could fix that, and Goku actually has an idea. Bulma could probably make them a spaceship, send them to a planet that has 10 times gravity. He goes to consult her, and she says the easier option is just to make a room that could change gravity. He didn't even realize this was an option, and hey, this is way better. But she pulls Goku aside, asking if he's really sure they could trust Raditz. And Goku says they can't, and if something does happen, he could stop Raditz. He knows it. Some time passes. The two start training together, learning a little bit more about each other too. This is weird for Raditz. Goku's trying to form a bond with him, but Raditz doesn't really care too much. At least not really at first. He starts warming up to Kakarot on the plan after seeing his motivation and drive, and how quickly he seems to grow. The two of them are similar in a lot of ways after all. Besides them being brothers, they're both low-class Saiyans. And it's amazing that Goku even grew as strong as he is on this weak planet. So who knows, once he trains like a real Saiyan, maybe they can grow very quickly together, also unlocking that ability of foresight. They still don't know how to control it at will, and that's one of their goals. They want to learn how to utilize it, especially Goku since he can't really tap into it like Raditz. And for Raditz, it's still unconsciously done. He doesn't willingly have the visions happen. There seems to be things that trigger them, but they don't always happen when he needs them. And he's going to change that. He feels like it might be possible. And what better person to work on that with than someone that actually has the same ability? Eventually though, Raditz gets contact from someone through his scouter. He completely forgot. The Saiyans are contacting him, Vegeta and Nappa. They wonder where Raditz is. He's been gone a bit long, and thankfully he's still alive at least. Nappa calls in, asking where he is, and Raditz can't really hide it. He's on Earth, but he can try and stall and have some sort of lie going on. This is kind of bad. He wants to keep them away from Earth, and he doesn't want to return just yet. So he comes up with a lie, saying that there was an issue. He ended up going to the wrong planet and has to fight his way out. And Nappa questions this, but he said it was on Earth. That's where Kakarot got sent, right? And Raditz says that's not the case. It doesn't seem like Kakarot's here, but the planet is pretty strong. He's gonna be here a bit longer trying to fight everybody to get out of here. And who knows, maybe he can conquer it along the way. Nappa kind of buys it, but Vegeta steps in too. He calls Raditz an idiot and says he shouldn't expect any help here. And Raditz knows not to. It's better that way. He says, no, don't come out here anyways. He can handle this himself. But Vegeta's definitely suspicious. Something's weird. Something's fishy about Raditz saying that. Maybe he found something they don't want him to see. And Nappa asks why he's thinking that. It sounded to him like Raditz was telling the truth. But Vegeta could hear in his voice. Raditz was acting very shifty. And he's been there for far too long. Yeah, they've had long battles before, but he's been on that planet for weeks by now. And even if he were having trouble before, the battle would have ended already. He'd be dead or he would have won. It's very strange to Vegeta, and he wonders what their next move should be. Well, maybe they could head to that planet too, actually. 
If Radis is lying, well, they'll find out that way. And if he's telling the truth, they'll get in on the profits together when selling the planet. If the population is that strong, the planet might actually be pretty valuable. And after this call ends, Raditz decides it's time to actually own up to Kakarot. And Goku wonders what he's talking about. But Raditz says they're profits after all. Kakarot might find out on his own anyways. Initially, he had different plans for the planet. He was sure to get Kakarot to join them in any way possible, even if that meant taking him by force. But as he was arriving here, that changed. He had a vision of the future, him actually dying against Kakarot, with some other person involved. And he thinks it was that Namekian he encountered before. Wait, Piccolo? Oh yeah, Goku completely forgot Piccolo was out there. Raditz met him? Well, yeah. And Raditz says it's not really important. Point is, he didn't want to hide this from Kakarot. But Goku says it's fine. He could tell Raditz is genuine about his intentions. Even if he wasn't before, he definitely is now. But that brings up an interesting thing. Goku wonders, what is Piccolo up to? Well, he actually has a plan in mind. He was spying on them when Raditz actually found Goku, wondering why he was seeking Goku out in the first place. He didn't get involved. He didn't really need to. But he was nearby, listening in. So these two are brothers. They are actually aliens. And in Piccolo's mind, that means they're both threats. Goku is still his main target, but if Raditz is his brother, that's just another person he needs to defeat. In order to take over the world, he needs both of them gone. And since it's only two of them, it shouldn't be an issue. Right now, he's still unaware that they're training, but he assumes that's probably what they're up to. He's gonna be doing the same. He's further improving a technique that he was gonna use to kill Goku, but now it looks like he's gonna have to modify it a little bit more. As the training with Goku and Raditz continues, Raditz wonders a few things. Well, for one, he kind of wants Gohan to train up too, just because he's a Hyper Saiyan could potentially have a lot of power within it. And Goku's been trying to get him to train, but Chi Chi's not really too fond of it, especially since Raditz showed up and she doesn't really trust him either. But she's starting to warm up to the idea, thanks to a lot of convincing from Goku. Gohan's not going to train a lot, but he's going to get involved, at least with Goku, and he doesn't really know what to think of Raditz either. Raditz is kind of intimidating, but Goku assures Gohan he has nothing to worry about, and Raditz wonders, does Gohan have that same ability too? He wonders if they can activate that for Gohan, not realizing that this ability isn't genetic. And Goku asks Gohan, has he had any prophecies lately? And Gohan has absolutely no clue of what he's even talking about. He probably doesn't even know what the word means. Well, maybe it's a little bit more latent. The two of them still don't know how this even came to be. And as for Raditz, he was already a few years old by the time Bardock died and he got this ability. So he assumes if Gohan has it, it might take a little bit longer to develop, especially if Kakarot had issues with it too. Either way though, it's good to train up his strength. But Raditz has a strange vision. He foresees Vegeta on Earth. Nappa's there too, and around the same time, Goku has a similar vision. They could see it. Nappa's there, sprawled out on the ground, and Vegeta's there too. Battle damage, missing his tail. But Raditz looks the same. He's also missing his tail. Battle damage. Goku is too. Immediately after, there's another vision. They see a great ape. Only very briefly though, and they see a giant crater nearby. The vision ends though, with the great ape flashing by very quickly. They can't even tell who it is. And that was pretty strange. Another time where they both had a similar vision, around the same time. And Raditz says it's just like he thought. Vegeta didn't buy his excuse. The Saiyans might be coming here. And if they do so, they're probably going to arrive within the year. Well, change of plans. Before they go out to fight Frieza, they might have to face the Saiyans. And Goku asks if Raditz is really up for that. I mean, that's his crew after all. And Raditz is hesitant to say anything. But he says that he knows an alliance with Kakarot is more beneficial. They might not even have a choice. The Saiyans might be out here for blood. But at the same time, Raditz is thinking. They could be useful in the fight against Frieza. He has to try to get them on their side somehow. But at the same time, he doesn't know if he can even tell Vegeta what's happening here. He'll try to recruit Kakarot by force. It'll ruin Raditz's plan. But Goku tells Raditz, he's up for the challenge. And even if these Saiyans are tough, it shouldn't be an issue. Especially with the great training they're doing. And Goku has a ton of help. He'll get his friends recruited too. If the Saiyans are coming and threatening Earth, well, everyone's gonna stand up to them. But Goku feels like he's missing something from that vision. There's some details that they left out. They couldn't really focus on everything because there's so much going on at once. It kind of does concern him. But if Vegeta seemed to be defeated, and Nappa was too, maybe they're fine. Maybe they could win this. And Raditz got a clue from this too. He has to make sure not to lose his tail. Vegeta or Nappa will probably try to take it off during battle, so as long as he protects it from them, he'll be okay. And he could transform into a great ape, defeating them that way. When Goku recruits the humans too, they still don't really trust Raditz. I mean, he is a Saiyan after all, and if the Saiyans are coming here as enemies, that's just even less of a reason to trust Raditz. But if anything, this battle will help prove that Raditz truly is on their side, and its intentions are accurate. No one's really sure what to think, but whatever. Over the next year, more training ensues. Goku and Raditz continue gravity training. It takes a bit for them to get used to higher levels, and Raditz is a little bit ahead of Goku too because he's already used to 10 times gravity. But they do end up seeing a ton of growth, and the humans try and use the gravity room too, but they don't seem to be on that level yet. It's fine though, they have their own training. And after this time skip, the humans would probably be around where they were normally, since they're not really going to change their training too much. As for Raditz and Goku though, that's going to be very different. Goku takes a bit longer to get adjusted, but after adjusting to the gravity and going to higher levels, he actually reaches about 10,000 for his power. 
and Raddus was already adjusted to 10 times gravity, but has to slow down a bit since he is training with Capra. But he's able to get to a power of 15,000, something that's huge for him. He definitely surpassed Nappa, and he's almost on Vegeta's level. And as for Piccolo, well, no one knows what's going on with him, but he's definitely gotten stronger. He's purely focused on training himself here, unlike in the main story where he was focused on training Gohan during this arc. Piccolo has no clue of what's about to happen either, but he's ready to kill Raditz and Goku. Gohan would probably be significantly stronger too. Let's place him at around 3000. They still don't really know his true power yet, but since he was training with Goku, Goku took a way different approach to training him than Piccolo did, so Gohan was actually more inviting of the training. Glad to train with his father, and getting a little bit more knowledgeable about his uncle, even though he still is weirded out by him. But everyone's getting on better terms with Raditz. I mean, Goku's already vouching for him too, and he hasn't tried anything yet, so hey, they could probably trust him by now. He still definitely isn't good yet, but he may be heading down that path. Who really knows? The Saiyans eventually arrive, with everyone expecting that arrival, ready to face them. And Raditz and Goku already have a plan. They want to work as quickly as possible, blitzing them. Raditz is going to create an artificial moon, and he wants to make sure that Gohan doesn't transform too, so they make sure that he's not going to see that artificial moon. Raditz will create this right away, as Goku launches in towards Vegeta and Nappa, trying to remove their tails somehow. Alongside the other humans, don't waste any time, just go for it immediately. Vegeta says that he knew it. Of course Raditz betrayed them. What a joke. Why was he hiding from them? Was he plotting against them? And Raditz says it's not that. Well, why didn't he reveal what he was up to then? And Raditz tells him this is all part of his plan to defeat Frieza. He knows it'll work. He doesn't flat out say this, but his visions told him that this is the right way to go. He hasn't had any conflicting visions since, and he knows that he and Kakarot are going to face Frieza together. Vegeta laughs at this. Those two low-class Saiyans? They have no hope of facing Frieza. And Vegeta says that still doesn't explain why he was working against them. Why he lied to Vegeta and Nap about where he was and what he was up to. And Raditz can't really explain either. He still doesn't want them knowing about the visions. He never really told them about it before, only really alluding to it. And he can't come up with a reason on the spot for why he didn't tell them, but he just knew that he couldn't. And Vegeta's pissed off at the fact that he's not getting an answer from Raditz. Alright then, he wants to fight? Then so be it. Raditz tries to stop Vegeta, trying to think of a way to explain this without giving it away. He doesn't want to kill Vegeta and Nappa, but he's definitely going to have to fight them. Vegeta's not giving him any option. Immediately, Raditz tries to create an artificial moon, as Goku jumps in, lunging at Vegeta, with the others rushing in towards Nappa, trying to stop him somehow. Vegeta faces off against Goku, protecting his tail, knowing exactly what Goku's trying to do, as Raditz stands nearby, transforming into a great ape. And Nappa faces all of the humans and Gohan at once, and they don't hold back at all. They use their full strength, collectively working together in order to defeat him. Their combined strength overcomes his, and they're able to knock Nappa unconscious. But Goku's unsuccessful. He holds Vegeta off, but Vegeta's able to protect his tail. Vegeta's stronger than he thought, but it's fine. Raditz was able to transform, and Vegeta still hasn't transformed yet. They may still have a shot. Nappa's already unconscious. This is working. Vegeta then charges Ki in his hand, swiping it towards everybody, knocking them all away as he then looks up at the artificial moon himself. Raditz is already fully transformed, and he runs in towards Vegeta, trying to stomp on him, and his foot connects with the ground, but it's already too late. He catches Raditz's foot, starting to grow in size. He took a little bit of damage from that attack, but the transformation already started, so he didn't really take the full brunt of it. He stares down Raditz, roaring as he's ready to start fighting Raditz. The two great apes clash, and meanwhile, Vegeta knows that he has to protect his tail. He knows the others are going to try to go for it, trying to remove it so he's no longer transformed into a great ape. But this is going to be tough. He has to hold off Raditz, which really shouldn't be too hard, but it's the fact that he has to worry about everyone else, not knowing what they're up to. He's able to pull this off though. He has enough strength and speed to actually do so. But there's somebody that he's forgetting, as well as the others. They don't realize that there's somebody else there, watching over them. They're also focused on Vegeta, but at one point in the battle, Raditz senses a huge power surge nearby. It's not massive, not on his level, but it's still pretty strong, and growing stronger by the moment. Vegeta can't sense this, he can't sense power, and Raditz wonders what it is, but he's too distracted by Vegeta to look, but then he knows he needs to take action. He senses an attack. In the nick of time, he dodges. A beam flies right past him, but the beam hits Vegeta, piercing right through his arm. Raditz looks over. It's that Namekian, he's standing nearby in a cliff, ready to kill the Saiyans. Damn it, he nearly hit both apes, he was hoping to kill both of them with that one attack. He had them lined up perfectly. And Vegeta sees it too, angered that he was injured by this attack. He lunges towards Piccolo, but as he does, Raditz picks up Goku. Goku charges Ki in his hand, and Raditz flings Goku right at Vegeta. Just as Vegeta's fist is about to land on Piccolo, Goku swipes his arm down at Vegeta's tail, cutting it clean off, causing Vegeta to de-transform. And Raditz sees another opportunity. He tries to crush Vegeta, but just as he's about to do so, he feels a sharp pain in his tail. Piccolo attacked him as well. Goku yells out, calling Piccolo an idiot. Why did he have to get involved? And Goku sees now what he was forgetting. In that vision, this is the thing he overlooked. Piccolo getting involved. Piccolo's not working with them after all. He wants all the Saiyans dead, and that's exactly what's happening here. Obviously, he saw Vegeta and Nappa as a threat, but Raditz and Goku are still in his sights. Vegeta weakly stands up, still ready to fight, and Piccolo then jumps in. Goku and Raditz have no idea of what to do. Piccolo tells them, the only one who will claim victory here is him. 
This is his plan to take over. The Saiyan invaders need to go, and he'll defeat them. That includes Raditz. He's not who he says he is. And even if he is on Goku's side, that's still a reason to kill him. But Raditz and Goku feel like they're still missing something. Something in that vision that they're looking over. If they forgot about Piccolo, then there's gotta be something else they're missing. I mean, they still don't see that massive crater, and they feel like that's still important somehow, and they have no clue why. Vegeta stares down everyone, ready to take them all on at once, with Piccolo also there, ready to battle too, not alongside Goku and Raditz them, for himself. And nearby, Nappa's lying on the ground. He twitches. He's still unconscious, but little does everyone know, he's about to reawaken. The humans decided to help Goku and Raditz against Vegeta, leaving Nappa there unconscious, not realizing that he still has his tail. Vegeta's backed into a quarter. Piccolo stands there triumphantly, and the group is ready to defeat Vegeta. But Vegeta's not done yet. He's not gonna die here. This Namekian, these two low-class Saiyans, they're not gonna kill him. They might be able to get close, but they're not gonna finish it. And look at this, they need all these people together just to defeat the prince. Key charges around him as he explodes with anger. Jumping up into the air, quickly firing a barrage of Key Blast down at the ground below. He's aiming at random, and everyone's trying to defend against him. Goku and Raz aren't particularly phased, but for everyone else, this is a pretty big risk, especially since he's firing blindly. At least, at first. Vegeta's eyes dart around, and then he sees Piccolo once more, that Namekian. He'll be the first to go. Quickly in one hand, he charges up a powerful blast aimed at Goku and Raditz. He assumes Kakarot's the weaker one, so he launches it towards him. And Piccolo can sense Vegeta coming towards him. Through the smoke, Vegeta appears. Piccolo feels a sharp pain in his gut as he's knocked far away with a shockwave. Vegeta then rockets towards where Piccolo's flying, delivering a powerful kick, sending Piccolo all the way up into the sky. He tries to catch himself and desperately tries to fight back. He whips himself around, charging a mouthbeat, launching it down at Vegeta. But Vegeta quickly counters it, and then, with his other arm, he points two fingers at Piccolo. Dirty fireworks. But he stopped just in time. Raditz and Goku fly over, intervening. They land a simultaneous strike on Vegeta, and with their combined power, they're able to knock him unconscious. He's already taken enough damage. And they're able to save Piccolo from this. Raditz curses it. That idiot shouldn't have gotten involved. He could have ruined the whole thing. But Goku says Piccolo probably had a good plan. He might have just assumed that Raditz was a threat. He couldn't trust him. Of course, Piccolo's completely separated from the group, and he's probably been eavesdropping. He probably knows that Raditz has joined them, but that doesn't mean Piccolo's gonna instantly trust Raditz. Especially not Vegeta either. He wants to defeat both of those Saiyans, and also Goku. Piccolo falls from the sky unconscious. As Raditz looks down at Vegeta, contemplating what to do next, and Goku's also wondering the same thing. It would be such a shame to kill a fighter that strong though, not to mention, he's unconscious. It would be incredibly cowardly to kill him. Same goes for Nappa. Actually, now that I think about it, where is Nappa? He was knocked out a while ago. Raditz points a hand at Vegeta, contemplating if he should kill him or not. But before he can even act, they feel a rumbling. And looking back where they just were before, they see a massive explosion. And Raditz immediately recognizes that attack. No! They completely forgot. They rush over as a giant ape rises up. Nappa has regained consciousness and transformed. He'll finish this battle. This giant storm knocks everybody back, and is completely unrestrained. Gohan, Krillin, and Tenshinhan are launched far away, heavily injured from the attack. Yamcha, Chiaotzu, and Yajirobe aren't so lucky. With this single attack, Nappa was able to easily eradicate them. They had no chance at surviving it, and the group doesn't even realize it yet. Nappa then turns over, seeing Goku and Raditz flying over. He lifts his arms up and screams. They're screwed now, and Goku remembers now. Wait, this is what that vision was that he saw. That giant crater, it's exactly here, the Great Ape. That wasn't a warning about Vegeta or anything. It was warning about Nappa still being around, and it must have been pretty important for that to be a vision. He says he's gonna search around for everyone to see who lived, and Raditz says he'll try and do something to distract Nappa. Goku looks around desperately, trying to see if everybody's okay. Nappa does try to attack him, but before he can land an attack, Raditz is able to jump up, rocketing himself right towards Nappa's eye, punching right into it, gouging it clean out. Nappa shrieks in pain, cursing Raditz. He tries swiping his arm in the air trying to grab Raditz, and Raditz desperately flies around trying to narrowly avoid it. He's already used up all his power. They need to think of something quick. Goku was able to find Krillin, Tenshinhan, and Gohan but he can't sense the three others. He didn't even realize Yajirobe was there lurking about, but he already fears the worst not seeing them. Krillin gets back up, terrified at the sight of another great ape. What are they supposed to do here? Goku says he'll distract Nappa with Raditz. He needs Krillin or someone else to go in and cut off the tail, but it needs to be quick, otherwise they're all dead. Nappa's able to finally grab Raditz, holding him in one hand, telling Raditz he's gonna crush him, squeezing the life out of him. But suddenly, his grip loosens on Raditz. Once again, he shrieks in pain, turning around to see his tails cut off. And Goku gets over there and sees this too. Raditz is dropped to the ground below, narrowly avoiding every bone in his body being broken. And the two see, Piccolo is there behind Raditz, smirking. He said he wouldn't let the Saiyans win. In the nick of time though, Nappa is able to turn around, opening his mouth wide, launching a massive blast, eradicating Piccolo. He continues shrinking, and as he does so, Goku and Raditz see as an opening to attack. With everyone else joining in too, knocking Nappa out cold once more. There's multiple casualties, completely unexpected too. 
Nappa of all people being the one to do that. They thought he wasn't an issue anymore. Raditz can't believe he overlooked that. Yamcha, Yajirobe, Chiaotzu. Goku's angered at the fact that they've been killed needlessly. But then he realized something else. Piccolo's dead, which means Kami died too. And there's no Dragon Balls anymore. It's worse than he thought. Not only because it means they lost Kami, but it means none of those four could be brought back. And yeah, Piccolo wasn't a great guy either, but still, he did somewhat help them there. Goku slams a fist into the ground. He should have paid more attention to that vision he had. Or maybe it wasn't something that could have been reversed. What if that was something that was self-fulfilling? That was his vision. It was an outcome that he couldn't change. Yeah, they may have won, but still, it wasn't a total win. And he asked Raditz, has he experienced anything like that before? An outcome that he couldn't change? And Raditz says most of the time it just showed him the key to victory in a battle. Vision that usually showed him the outcome of battles. Or possibly where their next target was. Although, he's never been in a fight this intense. One that was life or death for him. One in which he wasn't 100% sure that he could survive. But now that Goku mentions it, he wonders if it's true. Well, he did see a prophecy before. One that he did change. He saw his death at Goku and Piccolo's hands. Now he recognized that was Piccolo in the vision. So, maybe these aren't completely set in stone. It may seem like it, but Raditz has proof of it. It's not set in stone. The question is, are all of their visions like this? Because in their eyes, every outcome is likely. They might be flexible. They might be set in stone. They might be self-fulfilling. They have no clue of what to think about it. But there's no point focusing on that. At least not anymore. The battle's over. So, where are they supposed to go now? Well, Krillin actually has an idea. What if they go find the place where Piccolo's from? Planet Namek. Maybe that place would actually have some Dragon Balls, and they could use that to bring everybody back. It's a long shot, but it could work. Raditz walks over to where Nappa's lying down, and he tells Goku to go retrieve Vegeta. The group wants to kill the two Saiyans, especially Tenshinhan and Krillin. And Raditz even thinks about it too. But something changes his mind. The two Saiyans wake up, and Raditz smiles. He's looking down upon them now. He's ecstatic that he won against these two, proving his superiority. Goku already mentioned to Raditz that it would be cowardly to just kill them while they're unconscious. Not to mention, it would be a waste of their strength if they just killed these two Saiyans here now. Pretty much the same reason Goku decided to spare Vegeta anyways. But Raditz also thought of something else. A gut feeling of his. Not actually a vision, just a gut feeling. Maybe these two could actually help them against Frieza. They definitely would be motivated for that. But why kill them? Why not use them as allies? And Raditz brings us up to the two Saiyans. But Vegeta calls him an idiot. They can't kill Frieza. Besides the fact that Vegeta doesn't want to team up with these two traitors. Even if they did, what would they do against Frieza? Hell, they can't even defeat the Ginyu Force if they want. Vegeta quickly calls a spaceship. And the brothers stand there watching. Krillin and Ten have an uneasy feeling. Same for Gohan too. Should they actually be letting these two go? Vegeta and Nappa are just as surprised. But nothing ends up happening. They actually are spared. Their spaceships arrive and they crawl onto them. As the ships rise up in the air, the two are conversing. Nappa heard something while he was out. Something about some Dragon Balls on Planet Namek or something. Maybe they could go there. And Vegeta's stunned to hear this. Maybe those are the fabled wish orbs. Do they actually exist? The two pods fly off. And Goku turns to Raditz. He says it's no use. They'll probably show up eventually though. He hasn't foreseen it, but he has a gut feeling. Kind of like Raditz just had now. And he's thankful for Raditz sparing them. And Raditz gets kind of mad at this. He reminds Kakarot. He's not sparing them because he's some goody-goody. It's just that they're all Saiyans. It's not right that they're killing each other. They should be teaming up against Frieza after all. The other three just stand there watching. Ten doesn't really know what to think about Raditz, especially after saying something like that. Same for Krillin. He drew the Saiyans here after all, and he got all their friends killed. Is Raditz truly someone on their side, especially when he's still acting that way? Goku can't explain it too well to them, but they're gonna have to trust him on this one. Besides, it's not completely Raditz's fault. I mean, even if Raditz didn't come here, maybe the Saiyans would have come here eventually to get Goku. Or worse, that Frieza guy would have shown up. But even besides that, he would love to try and explain his vision to them, his foresight. But he can't really explain it, he can't put it in words. And there's no way he could actually show them and get them to fully trust it. But he does know one thing. Having Raditz around actually helped awaken this ability somehow. The connection between the two of them. And Goku thinks this would be an amazing ability for battle. He wants to hone it. And Raditz can help. Not to mention, they know their path now. They know what they need to do. There's a short passage of time. But actually, the group's going to end up arriving on Namek a little bit earlier than normal. And there's a few reasons for this. One of the big things is that they're all going together because Goku doesn't need to heal up a long time. Actually, that goes for pretty much everyone around here. Raditz was probably injured at the worst. But even then, they didn't use any Senzu beans yet, so they'd have one lying around for him. There's also another factor. Raditz immediately suggests using his spaceship. It's a great thing for Bulma to study and take parts from, which somewhat speeds up the process of building the ship. Also, since the gravity room already does exist here, and the fact that they realize the trip might take a little bit, Raditz suggests putting this room on the ship, just so they can train in the meantime. And the crew's a little bit different too. Instead of just Krillin, Bulma, and Gohan, it's Krillin, Bulma, Gohan, and also three others, Goku, Raditz, and Tenshinhan. Although it's kind of annoying for Bulma because so many people are on the ship at once training. But it works out nicely for them, by the time they arrive on Namek, here's their power levels. Goku's at around 200,000, with Raditz being pretty equal to him. 
Goku's actually caught up. And Raditz is perplexed. He grew so quickly. He needs to start taking his training a lot more seriously. Gohan's a lot lower, but it's still pretty high. 100,000. Goku and Raditz have the benefit of training at higher levels, which Ten and Krillin don't really have the benefit of. They actually have their own section out part of the ship where they train at lower levels of gravity, and they're both at around 30,000 right now. Not being able to train at the insane gravity levels that Goku and Raditz are. But still, it's a nice increase in power. Once they get to Namek, they immediately start going around the villages, using their dragon radar to try and find any sort of Dragon Balls here. And Raditz saw something interesting on their way here. He had another vision, one of a giant dragon, and he mentions this to Goku. And Goku asks him to clarify it a bit more. Well, Raditz saw himself on this green planet, and it does look like it was Namek, and he just remembers a giant green dragon. And Goku says that's it. If there's another dragon here, that means there's Dragon Balls. That confirms it for them. The Dragon Balls exist here. Although, gathering them isn't going to be as straightforward as they thought, because they encounter the Namekians, and it's not like they're going to fight. The Namekians are a peaceful people, but they're not just going to give up their Dragon Balls to random strangers. Especially with someone like Raditz there who looks pretty intimidating. Of course, no fight breaks out though. And instead, these visitors are taken to Guru. Goku explains everything to him, and why they're here for the Dragon Balls. And Guru tells Goku to step up. He places a hand on his head, reading his mind. And he sees his intent. He's genuine. And this man, he's pure of heart too. He senses no malice within him. That one other Saiyan over there. He's definitely more malicious. But the rest of the group, they actually seem okay. And their intent is genuine. They're here to revive their friends. Mainly focus on bringing back their guardian of Earth too, a fellow Namekian that bestowed Dragon Balls upon them. And because of this, Guru is sympathetic to their plight, especially due to how it happened. The group is able to gather the Dragon Balls, and they go outside near Guru's place, summoning the dragon. And Raditz is amazed seeing this. The Namekians have seen this before, and as for everybody else here, they've seen Shenron, and it's cool to see another dragon like this. But Raditz's mind is blown. He's never seen anything like it. Well, that kind of explains why they're called Dragon Balls at least. And they're amazed to hear that this dragon actually grants three wishes, not just one. That's even better, because apparently they can only revive one person at a time, a downside that Shenron doesn't have. But that works perfectly, they'll revive Kami first. Although with only two wishes left, somebody's gonna have to wait. But it doesn't matter. Once Kami's brought back, they could summon Shenron to bring back their other friends. Chaozu's brought back because he needs to be brought back by Namek's Dragon Balls, with Yamcha and Yajirobe trying to decide who goes first, with Bulma insisting that it's Yamcha. Yajirobe's kinda pissed off about this, but whatever, he could wait a little bit longer. Alright, and that's that. They summoned the dragon and they got their friends back. Well, four out of five. The wish with Kami brought Piccolo back too, even though he's not really a friend, but you get what I mean. Still a success. Now they can head back to Earth, doing some more training on the trip back just to kill time. But as they're about to leave, a ship descends from above, with a massive key blast coming down towards the planet. Guru is monitoring everything. He could already tell something bad's about to happen. Goku and Raditz hear a voice in their head. Come to Guru. But Raditz says they can't leave. He knows exactly who this is. This is Frieza. He recognizes the ship immediately. He can't believe it. He didn't expect to see Frieza so soon. And while part of him does want to stay and fight, at the same time, there's something in him telling him to leave. It's these two conflicting thoughts. Maybe it's because he's panicked. He realizes that he might actually be screwed here. How are they supposed to defeat Frieza now? It's far too soon to encounter him. A warrior in a Mechian steps in. It's Nail. He tells them he'll handle this, or at least buy them some time. If Guru requested their presence, then they have to go see him. They need to show respect to him, and also, they should listen to his command because he let them use the Dragon Balls. Raditz doesn't like the idea of being ordered around, but Goku suggests they should go. Guru tells them to hurry back there. Gohan, Ten, and Krillin come along too. Guru tells them he doesn't have much time left. And now with this threat on planet Namek, he needs someone to defend it. He's not sure if his warriors will be strong enough, but he can grant them power, unlock their potential, allowing them to fight Frieza and defend Namek in the process. It's the only thing he can think of to save his people. Nail stands against Frieza. And Frieza said he just saw a few others over here. Where did they go? And Nail says that's none of his business. If Frieza knows what's best for him, he should leave now. And Frieza doesn't like this Namekian talking back to him. Alright, he's gonna give him one more chance. He points a finger at Nail. Where are the Dragon Balls? And Nail's surprised. Another person here for the Dragon Balls. But how did Frieza even hear of it? And Frieza knows they exist. Right before they got here, they saw that dragon from space. When Nappa was talking to Vegeta about it, he overheard their little conversation and decided to check out Namek for himself. But before Frieza can say anything else, five other people fly over, and there's a massive explosion behind him. His ship is completely eradicated, and all his soldiers destroyed in one swoop. Raditz lands first. It's a good thing he tried to copy that technique from Nappa. It sure is pretty useful. And Frieza is fuming. The four others land beside him. So that's where that other Saiyan went. He came here somehow, and he's with whoever these other people are. And Raditz asks Frieza why he's here. Well, for the Dragon Balls, of course. And he demands to know where they are before he just slaughters everybody here. Raditz laughs, telling him it's no use. They were just used, so there's no way he's going to be able to summon Franga. Besides, the Elder's on his dying breath. He's never going to have another chance to use the Dragon Balls. There are none anymore. And Goku steps in too. He tells Frieza to leave immediately. Namek's a peaceful place. Don't ruin this peace. 
There's no Dragon Balls here, and there's no need for more destruction. But Goku is kind of excited to fight this guy. He heard so much about Frieza, and of course he wants to test out his new power. As much as he hates the idea of him being gifted this power, still, it's at least for a good cause. He at least wants to carry out Guru's last wish. Guru is still there, watching it, but the stress is accelerating his death. He knows he's going to die soon, and he hopes to at least witness Frieza being defeated so he can die assured that his plan is safe. Frieza hits Goku with a rebuttal. Well, Raditz already attacked his army. Why would he not fight back? If anything, they're the aggressors, so he may as well join in on the battle too. But then something clicks with him. As he looks at Goku, he recognizes something. That hairstyle, it looks so familiar for some reason. Frieza could recognize Goku. He could tell that hairstyle, it's unmistakable. He looks like that other Saiyan, that one that rebelled against him so long ago. There's no doubt about it, that must be his son. That's the other one Raditz was looking for. And he heard Raditz call him brother. These two, they're both the kids of that one Saiyan that rebelled. Although, Frieza's not put off by this. He tells them, they'll face the same fate as their father. They actually don't have any clue of what he's talking about. And he decides to humor them before they die. It's true, long ago, their father tried to rebel against him. It was during Planet Vegeta's destruction as well. Of course, it was a pretty hopeless endeavor. He was destroyed alongside the planet, lost to time and forgotten with the rest of the Saiyans. Goku's pretty surprised to hear this, not knowing anything about Bardock. And not having too much of an attachment to him either. And as for Raditz, well, he kind of admires it. This doesn't anger him. It resonates with him. It empowers him. So it runs in his blood, this rebellion. He tells Frieza. Frieza might have killed his father, but he didn't kill that idea. He didn't kill Bardock's drive. It lives on through Raditz and through Kakarot. Goku honestly has no clue of what Raditz is talking about, but Raditz proudly proclaims this. Even if a low-class Saiyan couldn't have defeated him then, one will now. Two of them, in fact. Thanks to Guru, their potential has been unlocked so they could face Frieza. Guru wanted them to protect Namek, and this was the way they could help. Right now, everyone is far stronger and collectively, they might actually be able to do something against Frieza. Plus, they have an extra person there with them. Nail's there to help. If they knew Frieza was gonna show up, they would've summoned one of their friends here, but it's fine. This should be more than enough. Goku, Raditz, Gohan, and Shinhan, Krillin, and Nail all stand together, and Raditz decides to lead the charge. He tries to kill Frieza right away, showcasing his full strength, holding nothing back. And Frieza can't believe it. How is Raditz so powerful? No Saiyan should be this strong, much less a low-class one. And what's more surprising, it's not just Raditz. The other Saiyan, Goku, He's just as strong as Raditz, if not stronger. Frieza's heavily beaten in his first form. He wants to transform, but he can't. He needs to find an opening. Every time he thinks he has an opening, someone else attacks him. Even the humans, they're pretty powerful. Not enough to defeat him alone, but when helping with the group, everyone is too much for him to take on at once. But finally, he has an opening. In one hand, he charges Ki, with the Ki coalescing in each of his fingertips. He aims for the weak ones, the humans, that Namekian, and that child. With four fingers outstretched, a death beam is launched at each of them. Goku jumps in front, being able to defend against some of them, while Raditz defends against the others. And Raditz curses it. He shouldn't have done that. He should've just let them perish. Because now he sees. Frieza was doing that just to get an opening. And quickly, Frieza tries to gather all of his power together. Raditz can't believe it. He's going soft. But maybe this was the right move. He hasn't gotten any vision or anything that shows his death. At least, not yet. So that means they might actually make it through this. Frieza's able to transform. Not even going into his second or third form. He immediately goes into his final form. To think that he has to use this. He's enraged. He can't believe it the fact that they have that much power to force him to go into this. But he'll make them regret all their choices up to now. It's a shame too, really. If he knew Raditz could have grown that strong, well, he would have been a great soldier for the Frieza Force. Too bad he's gonna have to die here, as well as the others. Maybe that other Saiyan would have been helpful too. No wonder Nappa and Vegeta came back so beat up. But he tells them, this fight won't be nearly as easy. They're amazed to see Frieza's final form. To think that he has a power like this, it's incredible. And now, the battle gets a lot tougher. They can't hold him off as he is, this power. It's unfathomable, and Frieza lets them in on a little secret. This is actually his final form. He skipped two others just for them. They suppress his power far too much. This way, he'll get to use his full strength to kill them, with nothing held back at all. He just wanted the Dragon Balls, and they got in his way. He'll make them pay for it. And first, why not target one of the stronger ones in the group, the one that slighted him the most, Raditz. He quickly whips his tail, knocking Goku far away. He stretches a hand out, launching a compressed blast of air that knocks everyone else back, then following that up with Key Blast towards all of them. Raditz lunges in once more, but Frieza blocks his attack. And then with his other hand, he launches a death beam. Raditz is barely able to dodge it. It hits him right in the leg. Frieza charges a key in his hand. Let's finish off Raditz first. As his power coalesces, he winds his fist back, throwing a punch. But someone jumps in the way. It's Goku. He knocks Raditz back, and Goku takes a blow right to the head. Frieza pulls his punch at the very end, not expecting this. But all the key gathered in Frieza's fist, it transfers right into the attack. Goku's knocked far into the ground. A powerful blow to the head. He's disoriented, and he gets up. This blow to the head, it affected him. He can't believe Frieza's this strong. But more importantly, he's so disoriented right now. 
he can't focus. And the most surprising thing is, this causes a vision. This concussive attack, it activates one. And Goku's panicked, this vision, he sees Gohan dying in it. It has to be a fluke, it's just because he hit his head. Krillin asks Goku what's going on, and he tells Krillin he's fine. He's infuriated, but he controls himself. He could change his outcome. If that's actually what's gonna happen, well, he could prevent it. But still, he's disoriented, he took such a powerful attack. And after seeing that, how is he supposed to keep his cool? And he can't think clearly. He's still not sure if these visions are set in stone or not. Is this something he could change, or is this gonna be like the Nappa thing, where it's bound to happen? Raditz tells Goku to calm down, they'll fix it. But then Goku has another vision. They start rapidly firing. He sees Krillin dying at the hands of Frieza. He sees Tenshinhan dying. He sees the planet exploding. The final one, it's Raditz dying, laying on the ground next to Goku. And the last thing he sees is Frieza pointing right at him with key charges at his fingertips as everyone watches. He needs to keep focus. These visions, they can't be true. It's just messing with his head. He flies in the battle trying to help Raditz. He needs to prevent these outcomes. And Raditz can tell. His brother's disoriented. He's agitated. But he can't let that cloud his judgment in the battle. Raditz grabs his leg in pain as Goku flies up next to him. He reminds his brother, they've changed things before. Those visions, whatever he's seeing, he can't tell what it is, but they could fix it. And he asks his brother what he sees, and Goku says he just sees everyone dying. He saw multiple outcomes, and all of them, they involve loss. He's recollected himself, and Frieza laughs. What, he couldn't take that one attack? What's he so panicked for? And that thought flashed through Goku's mind again. Gohan dying, Krillin dying, Ten dying, everyone dying. These visions, they all contradict each other. Did he just see multiple futures? That means they can't all be true. One of them, just something, it has to be fake. But one of them could be true. And amidst the fight, Raditz sees a brief flash in front of him as well. It's him lying on the ground. Goku's next to him, and a death beam goes right through Goku's chest. And he wonders, is this what Goku saw? He's focused on the fight, but he tries to get that vision back. He can't. Although he notices something about that vision, it doesn't seem too far into the future. Just as this realization hits him, Frieza backhands Raditz right into the ground. Then he swipes an arm towards the rest of the group. The ground erupts, they're all knocked back once more, hopeless to resist it. As Raditz rockets towards the ground, he then sees Goku fall towards the ground as well. Quickly he tries to prop himself back up, launching towards Frieza, and Goku mutters to Raditz, telling him to stay back. This is what he saw too, this was the vision, this is the one that was going to come true. And it's almost like time slows down for both of them. Goku watches as Raditz jumps up, and he tries to yell out but he can't in time. He already knows what's going to happen, Raditz is about to land an attack, but just as he does so, Frieza quickly unleashes more power. And with a single finger pointed out, a beam is launched right through Raditz, setting him spiraling towards the ground, landing right next to Goku. Goku props himself up, he sees Raditz bleeding out next to him, and he sees another vision flash, it's that same one from before. It's the exact same, but now, it's here. Frieza slowly descends down laughing, mocking Goku. Yes, grieve over his brother. Had they not meddled in his plans, maybe they could have both lived. This is their own fault. And Raditz weakly chuckles. He sees what his brother saw, but he tells Goku, he saw something else, the reason that he jumped in front, trying to save Goku. It wasn't a vision involving his death, it was actually something after. Radish tries to get up, but he can't. He just looks at Frieza, telling him he's going to want to hear this too. He saw a strong and proud Saiyan warrior facing off against Frieza. And this vision, he could tell, it's happening now. He looks over to Goku, telling him to finish the job, fight Frieza, end this now, prevent the others from dying. And he says his last words to Goku, become the Super Saiyan. There's another blast from Frieza. The ground erupts, and Raditz is decimated, and Frieza lands, standing where Raditz once was. He sees the rest of the group, behind Goku, injured and barely able to stand up. Frieza mocks Goku once more. Seems like they both were going crazy. First, Goku with whatever visions he was having, and now Raditz, saying that apparently the Super Saiyan was here. Doesn't seem like there's any Super Saiyan around right now. Frieza's already won this battle. It's just about time to put the Saiyan out of his misery. Once more, he points a finger at Goku, launching a death beat. But just as it's about to hit, Goku yells. A fierce horror surrounds him, and the beam disintegrates from him. His hair starts flowing, and he looks over to the rest of the group. He tells them, they need to leave now. Krillin's still concerned, same for all the others. Goku's still not thinking clearly. He needs to fight with them here. There's no way he's going to fight Frieza alone, but Goku tells him not to worry. He's thinking more clearly than ever right now, thanks to what Raditz told him. He assures them once again, it's going to be okay. His aura flares up once more as his hair turns golden, and his eyes change color. Frieza's taken aback. It can't be. Goku stands there triumphantly. He's become the Super Saiyan. And surprisingly, he's pretty cool-headed and collected. He may have seen multiple outcomes, and Raditz did too, but he doesn't feel disoriented anymore. Those outcomes, they're not going to happen. The only one that happened was Raditz dying, but Raditz saw his own outcome, the one of Goku defeating Frieza. The rage he feels from seeing his friends die, from seeing his son die, regardless of if they actually happen or not, he still saw it, and he needs to prevent it. That anger fueled him, allowing him to transform, and Raditz was the tipping point. He hadn't known Raditz for long, nor the Saiyans, but he could tell. 
His brother was different from the others. Raditz has taught him a lot in their short time together, and Goku will make Frieza pay for that, protecting everyone else that he loves in the process. And as much as he would love to fight Frieza at his full power, he can't. He knows he has to finish this. As a Saiyan, he loves battle. He wants to fight him. And briefly, they do battle, with Frieza at his full power now, seeing no other option. But Goku knows he has to end this. He can't enjoy the fight. He needs to prevent everything else bad from happening. The others have made it back to the ship, hoping that Goku's okay. And in the distance, they see a brilliant blue beam of light as Goku fires a Kamehameha, launching Frieza out into space, disintegrating, with nothing left either. As Goku finishes firing the blast, he calms down, detransforming, going back into his base. And he looks around him, the planet, it's calm. And he can sense it, his friends are still safe. And Frieza, he's gone. Goku goes over to the ship, with everyone elated to see that he's okay. And now it's time for them to head home once more. They arrive home not too long after, and Goku knows what he wants to do immediately when he gets back. And he's been thinking of this, a way to kill two birds with one stone, or rather, revive two people with one wish. Kami's already gathered the Dragon Balls, and Goku's able to make the wish. He asks Shadon to revive those killed by Frieza and his men recently. And he hopes this will work. This way, it should revive Yajirobe, because he technically was killed by one of Frieza's men. And thankfully, the wish works as intended. This also considers Raditz. He's no longer considered one of Frieza's men, and he was killed by Frieza himself. He's brought back by this too. And he's elated. This is exactly what he wanted. Everyone's brought back to life. Piccolo, Yamcha, Chiaotzu, Kami, Yajirobe, and even Raditz. Although, there is something that they didn't consider. When Shenron leaves, they realize. Raditz didn't come back here. Surprisingly, it seems like he was brought back on Namek. There was no body for them to bring back because Raditz was just completely decimated by Frieza. And they thought he'd at least revive in Otherworld or something, but no, he came back on Namek. And they know this because they hear someone talking to them. In Otherworld, it's a guy named King Kai. He met some of the others when they got transported here. They did need something to do while dead after all. So they passed Snake Way and came to see him. And he's glad to be acquainted with these other people, especially the one who killed Frieza. And because of that, he does a little favor, telling them that Raditz is actually still on Namek. And back on Namek, Raditz is just as surprised. He can't believe it. He was brought back to life. And briefly, he knew that he was sent to hell, actually. But now he's here, back in the living world. He has another chance. And the planet, there's destruction around. But more Namekians come out of their hiding. And Raditz looks around. There's no Frieza in sight. Kakarot did it. He actually did it. He became a Super Saiyan, and he killed Frieza. Well done, Kakarot. Seems like he's gonna have to find his way back to Earth, though. But back on Earth, Goku knows. He'll see Raditz again someday. He'll find a way back here. And hopefully, that time will be soon. Some time passes, and on Earth, a ship arrives. Is it Raditz? It does look like one of Frieza's ships, so maybe he took one from Planet Namek and came back that way. But as the ship lands, everyone can sense some different powers on it, and Goku can immediately tell. Two of those powers, they're very familiar, and then there's one big power. He can't tell who it is, but they're all definitely hostile. Those two powers, it was Nappa and Vegeta, healed from their fight, having returned to Earth once more. They're the first to step off the ship, with someone else behind them. It looks like a bigger Frieza. It's King Cold. Frieza's father. After Frieza's defeat, King Cold of course wanted to seek out who killed him. The Namekians made haste. Guru died not too long after, but they already had the new elder Mori taken over. And as he made a new set of Dragon Balls, he made Paranga transport the planet somewhere else, keeping everyone safe. But Raditz was still stuck in there in the meantime, and there's a specific reason he decided to stay, but we aren't covering that right now. Although, he's fine with it. He doesn't mind remaining here a little bit longer. But because of this, that meant King Cold couldn't find Namek. So, they went to the next best place, with Vegeta and Nappa guiding him towards Earth. A place where there might be more Dragon Balls. A place where they could actually kill the people that killed Frieza. Of course, Vegeta and Nappa don't care about that revenge. They just care about the Dragon Balls. And honestly, King Cold doesn't really care either. He mainly just wants to get rid of the Super Saiyan, and maybe get immortality as well. Sounds like a cool wish. And King Cold tells the two Saiyans, fetch him the Dragon Balls. He trusts that they won't use them for themselves. First of all, they don't even know how to activate the Dragon Balls. And second of all, if they do try to double cross him, King Cold knows that he's more than strong enough to find them and stop them before they do so. Vegeta and Nappa happily oblige, but they know that King Cold's getting in over his head. If Kakarot truly is a Super Saiyan that defeated Frieza, there's no way that King Cold's gonna stand a chance against him. It's a win-win. King Cold and Kakarot will kill each other off. And in the meantime, they can get the Dragon Balls. Two birds with one stone. As long as King Cold and Kakarot hold each other off for long enough, once Vegeta and Nappa get the Dragon Balls, they can quickly make a wish. They're sure they can figure out some way to activate it, but they underestimate how strong Goku truly is. The battle between him and King Cold is relatively quick, especially because Goku doesn't want King Cold doing any more destruction like that. He immediately transforms, wiping King Cold off the face of the earth. And not to mention, while Vegeta and Nappa are gathering the Dragon Balls, some of the other warriors come to fight them. And surprisingly, they're incredibly powerful as well. How is this happening? They didn't account for this. They thought they'd only have to face weaklings while King Cold took on the Saiyan. And more importantly, Kakarot then shows up. How did he win that quickly? 
Vegeta and Nappa can't believe it, and Goku's standing there, in Super Saiyan, staring them down. Vegeta and Nappa have no clue of what to do, or what to think. Word got around that Kakarot defeated Frieza, but no one knew exactly how, it's not like Frieza was there to recount it. They knew he was powerful, but they didn't know he unlocked a transformation, and that the Super Saiyan was even a transformation at all. Goku proudly shows off the form. He says he guesses they knew of this too. And he tells them, they originally spared these two Saiyans so they could have a good fight one day. And he tells them that he knew they would return. They think he means it's just a hunch, but really Goku means he actually saw them return. After coming back from Namek, he saw a vision that they would arrive. Not that it's really an issue though, just that he saw this, which is good because that means his visions are starting to show him more things. Actually, ever since Guru unlocked his potential, he's had more visions. Not willingly though, he still doesn't have a control over them to have them whenever he wants but it seems like the full potential of his visions are actually showing. He's seeing more things that could possibly be threats, not just threats to him, but to everyone around him. But he tells the two seconds. He wants to face the two of them. It's like he said, that's why he spared them in the first place, and he'll face them alone. He won't even transform. Vegeta's pissed off by this. Does Kakar really think he could take them on alone? It doesn't matter if he's a Super Saiyan. If he's not gonna transform, he can't really be that strong in his base alone. Where does he get the nerve of being so cocky? And Goku tells them, he's sure about this. Pissed off by this disrespect, Vegeta and Nappa try facing him, and as you'd probably expect, Goku absolutely wipes the floor with them. He used this as a chance to humble them. Even Gohan and the humans could beat them too, he says. He did expect a little bit more of an interesting fight, but this also shows the Saiyans their place. Vegeta and Nappa still can't believe it, and they ask about Raditz. What happened with him? There's no point hiding the fact about the Dragon Balls anymore since they already know about them. So he simply says that Raditz died and got revived back on Namek. They don't know if or when he's going to come back. He probably will though. Goku tried out something interesting in this battle. It didn't actually work though. He wants to try and make these visions that he had short term, just so he could use them in battle and predict movements. This was a pretty low effort fight, so it was a safe way to try and test this out. But he couldn't make it work. He still can't willingly control those visions. But if he can, that would be awesome. It would let him see his opponent's moves before they make them. He's got to figure out some different way to train. His power is great as is. He has no problem using raw strength. But combining that with this ability, it could be potentially amazing. Piccolo is eavesdropping on this whole situation too. Still separated from the group, Piccolo is still kind of a lone wolf, and he still views those Saiyans as threats. Goku needs to finish them. He can't believe Goku's power now that he sees it. The thing is, Piccolo knows that he can't face Goku. Piccolo never had the development with the group that he originally had, but he's not attacking Goku out of the fact that he knows Goku will win. And inadvertently, Goku did revive him after all, due to need to bring Kami back. But seeing these Saiyans as threats, he wants to take them out, just like he initially wanted to. He's about to jump in, but Goku then calls Piccolo out. Goku knows he's there watching over them. No matter how much he suppresses his energy, Goku also saw that he'd encounter Piccolo here. So angrily, Piccolo shows himself. He asks Goku why he isn't killing these two. They were an issue before, and they could be an issue now. But Goku tells Piccolo, with that logic, he should probably just get rid of Piccolo somehow. He's not going to do it, but he's just reminding Piccolo. He's a threat to Earth as well. Shouldn't they just seal him up too while they're at it? Goku's of course joking around, but he gets the point across. And Piccolo tells him to stop messing around. This is serious. It's stupid to keep the Saiyans around. But he tells Piccolo he has an option for the two Saiyans and for Piccolo as well. Goku tells Vegeta and Nappa that he'll give him a choice. Obviously, he's not gonna let them get the Dragon Balls, and even if they tried to, they know that he could stop them. But he knows they also have nowhere else to go, so he has an offer. They could stay here if they don't cause trouble. It will benefit everyone. More training partners for Goku, and more knowledge about his Saiyan side, while they get to learn about Super Saiyan from him. Goku's friends can't believe this. He's actually gonna teach them Super Saiyan? Well, he's honestly not even sure if they could learn it. If anything, they'll give him more valuable info about the form. Goku knows nothing about it. Maybe they know some sort of legends about it. All he knows is what Raditz has told him in passing. Besides, who knows if this is even something they can achieve. And they saw what happened with Raditz too. He's still his normal Saiyan self, but he's not a threat either. I mean, look what he did on Namek too. He died for Goku's benefit. The Saiyans aren't set in stone as these evil people. Well, maybe these two are for all he knows, but that remains to be seen. Vegeta and Nappa are annoyed that Kakarot is talking down to them, but they do want to learn about this form. And Kakarot's right. They have nowhere else to go anyways. I mean, look at the Frieza Force, it's gone. And even if they wanted to try to make their own army, what are they gonna do with that? They have to face the facts. They've been outpaced here. They're not the strongest warriors in the universe, not even close. The group still doesn't really know why Goku's even doing this. They can't trust the Saiyans, but Goku says he probably can. It's very faint, but he did have one vision before, pretty recently, but it seems to be far in the future, a few years out actually. He remembers seeing the four Saiyans fighting alongside each other. Vegeta and Nappa could end up being allies for them. Although, maybe he completely misinterpreted the vision. It was pretty fuzzy after all, and not too detailed. Either way, he's not worried about these two being threats. And reluctantly, the two Saiyans end up staying here. There's a brief passage of time. Goku ends up actually training with Vegeta and Nappa. It's not like they're good as strong training partners, but they're good for information. Learning more about how to grow as a Saiyan. Yeah, Raditz was great for this too, but these two, especially Vegeta, they're a wealth of knowledge. 
Raditz gave him great guidance as a low-class warrior. These two, since they were so much higher up as Saiyans, they probably know things that not even Raditz knew. And one thing that really interests the Saiyans is the fact that Gohan is as strong as he is, a hybrid Saiyan. They didn't think a power like that would be possible, especially for a kid his age. Clearly, they've been underestimating the Earthlings and those low-class warriors. But one day amidst their training, somebody pops in out of nowhere. It's Raditz. He just teleported in. Oh great, that was kind of a risk. A wish was made to send him right back to Goku. And thankfully he didn't catch him at a bad time. They're in the middle of training right now. Of course, everyone's absolutely dumbfounded about how Raditz even got here. So, he explains what he's been up to and what happened. The Namekians weren't very powerful, of course, with physical strength, but they were a wealth of knowledge and mental fortitude. Raditz has wanted to go back to Earth for a while, but he really had no way out of there. The Namekians didn't have any spaceships around. And as for the Dragon Balls, well, Guru ended up dying. They needed to wait for Mori to become the Elder and make a new set of Dragon Balls for himself. It wasn't too hard for him to do so, but by the time he actually did this, Raditz already decided that it might be worthwhile staying here, at least for a little while longer, and he pulls Goku to the side. He claims he's improved his foresight and can look into the future at will. Goku's amazed to hear this. Wait, that's possible? He actually managed it? Well, Raditz says there was a lot that went into it, and there's a few caveats with it. He didn't grow much physically on Namek, but he grew a lot mentally. Again, these Namekians are a wealth of knowledge, and as more passive people, training like this, the meditation that he was doing, this was the perfect place to do so. Consulting the new Elder Mori actually helped him with this too. When Guru unlocked his potential, it seems his abilities improved slightly. Goku says he noticed this too, but Raditz says the new Elder was also able to awaken potential as well. Mori at least tried to do this. He wasn't as adept with it as Guru was, especially since it was basically his first time doing it. But with Guru being able to do it, Mori had this ability as well. And it actually somewhat worked, opening the floodgates for Raditz to use more of his potential. And that actually did improve his physical strength somewhat. But again, it wasn't as effective as what Guru had. And Raditz has learned a few things too. Right now though, if he willingly tries to foresee something, it's strange because he doesn't know exactly what to look for. The farther out he looks, the blurrier it is, as with their normal visions. But when he wants to actually see something in the future, it's kind of a strange thing. Like, yeah, this could help in battle. But if he willingly tries to conjure up something, he doesn't even know what to look for. If they know they're going to face an enemy soon, yeah, then he could use it for that. But that's the thing, they don't really know. Except for a couple things that Raditz has seen, and these visions weren't things he saw willingly at first. But now that he actually can see into the future when he wants, he does use this to try and survey these threats. And he has to warn Goku about something. One of these threats is an internal one. He ends up dying of some sort of virus soon. It doesn't seem like there was any sort of cure. But there's an upside to this. They know Goku is going to have this issue. And even more interestingly, this means they could change the future. Because Raditz already did that. The Namekians allowed him to use the Dragon Balls for helping defend their planet after all. One of the wishes obviously was meant to send him back to Earth. But he had another wish that he made. He asked Paranga to heal Goku. It wasn't too big of an issue for the dragon, so now, Goku shouldn't have to worry about this. And Goku's honestly surprised that Raditz did that for him. He's trusted Raditz for a while, but now, Raditz is being a little bit more empathetic than normal. Remember, he's on their side, but he's still not necessarily an amazing person. He's still motivated by self-gain rather than protecting others, which isn't necessarily bad because right now, he's not doing things that put others in harm's way for that. That's been his goal this whole time, self-preservation. But when he died on Namek for Goku, and now using this wish to protect his brother. It's a very interesting change that Goku didn't actually expect. But there's one more thing that Raditz learned from Mori. In the main series, Guru was actually able to see the history of Earth through Krillin. At least, the history of Kami. Mori tried this too and found something very strange. Granted, he wasn't as adept at this as Guru, just like he was with Unlocking Potential. But for some reason, he could sense some sort of Namekian involvement with Raditz and Goku. Possibly even another dragon. And Raditz questioned this. Does he mean that there was some sort of wish made to have him get this power? And who would have even done that? Mori doesn't know for sure, but what he does know is that there are Namekians on other planets out there. He doesn't know where, or even if this is what the case is, but it could be that someone made a wish to the Dragon Ball somewhere else. And if this is the case, Raditz says there's only one person he has in mind that could have done this. Their father. Who else? Why would anyone else make this wish? And more importantly, where did he go to make this wish? They want to figure out more about this ability, and even though they're somewhat both learning to control it, the only way to learn even more about it is to go to the source of it. Well, maybe there's other ways, but Raditz thinks this is the best way to do so. And Goku's amazed to hear this. So, their father must have made some sort of wish. Of course, they don't know exactly what happened. They're still kind of off course. But they know that somehow Bardock and another Namekian was involved. Some sort of Dragon Balls on another planet that they don't know of. They'll definitely keep that in mind. And maybe this could help them further improve. And, at least now they know, this isn't something Gohan could access. It's nothing genetic. They could go to Namek again and have Goku try and get this too. Have Mori try to unlock his potential. But Goku says he'll go about it in his own way, especially if Raditz now knows how to work it more. Hell, maybe even Kami could try and do something like that, but they aren't too sure. The two of them start training together, meditating a lot actually, strengthening their state of mind trying to access this. Even if Kakarot's a Super Saiyan, Raditz sees this as a way to surpass him. The two are still very competitive, 
It's just in their nature and the fact that they're brothers after all. Raditz does need to unlock Super Saiyan still, but if he does unlock that with this ability, he could definitely pull ahead. Meanwhile, Goku has the advantage in raw strength, and he's learning to control Super Saiyan pretty well so far. He's got an amazing head start. Vegeta and Nappa are confused as to why they're just training like that. Why are they not training by fighting each other? It's so strange and unsaiyan like They kind of see the value in the training, but why are they putting so much emphasis on it? He always knew that something was off about them. They still don't know about the foresight. Goku and Raditz have purposely kept it a secret from them, but Vegeta and Nappa are wondering what's up. Amidst their training one day, Goku ends up having a strange vision and asks Raditz. Raditz sees the exact same thing. They foresee some strange monster showing up. A green bug looking person. It was only a brief flash. And Raditz tries focusing, trying to learn more about this. He doesn't know exactly what to look for, only that some green monster will show up. He doesn't know anything about this person and when they'll appear. If this is some big threat, he wants to try and prevent this. They know they could change the future now, at least somewhat. By now, over a year has passed since they went to Namek, and there's a very strange occurrence that happens. Goku shows up at his house one day. He looks slightly different, and they don't really know why, but he just doesn't look the same. Like, slightly older somehow. The only ones there are Chi-Chi and Ox King, and they ask Goku what's going on. Goku asks them, where's Goku? Wait, what? Goku? He says he'll explain later. He just needs to know where Goku is. But he's Goku, he's standing right there. And then Goku senses an energy nearby. He smiles. He tells them not to worry. He'll be back soon to explain it. Chi-Chi and Ox King are just left speechless. That was extremely off-putting, and they want to know what's going on. Somewhere nearby, Goku, Raditz, and Gohan are training together. And Gohan then yells out. He says there's another Goku here. Goku and Raditz look over to where Gohan is, and they do see it. There's another Goku standing there. Not only is this confusing, this is terrifying, but they could tell by his energy. He actually is Goku, he's not some sort of imposter that just looks like Goku. Raditz confirms this. He feels exactly like Kakarot's energy. What the actual hell? They confront this other Goku, having no idea what to even expect from him, and Goku says he's glad he found them. He understands they're all probably confused right now, but he could explain this pretty easily. He is Goku, from the future. Okay, that just made things even more confusing. He has a few things he needs to let them know. He says a few years from now, they're going to be attacked by the Red Ribbon Army. They made more androids. And he wants to warn them of this now so they could prevent it. Future Goku asks if they've foreseen this yet, and they actually haven't. They saw some green guy showing up, but no other androids or whatever. So Future Goku explains. He actually foresaw them attacking, but he didn't find a way to actually win against them. Raditz also saw this too in the future. He tried his hardest to guide everyone, because he actually had a full control over his ability. But his power still wasn't enough. By then, he only just unlocked Super Saiyan and didn't have an amazing control over it. And even with two Super Saiyans in the group, it wasn't enough to face the androids. Goku was barely able to live, and he was their main target after all. But due to him being a Super Saiyan and the strongest in the group, this allowed him to get by. Most of the fighters died. Goku did want to return to Namek. Piccolo ended up dying again, and there are no Dragon Balls here. But they couldn't go to Namek either. They don't know the location of Namek. It got moved after all. And for some reason, King Kai didn't intervene. This happened in the main series, so I'm gonna go with that here too. So because of that, they don't get any sort of directions to Namek. But future Goku says not everyone has died. There are some survivors. Goku's whole family, besides Raditz, is actually alive. Chi-Chi and Gohan are there. Bulma also survived too. And there's one other person he doesn't mention, mainly because he doesn't want to prevent him from being born in case he reveals his identity here. But he goes back to what they mentioned, some vision of a green monster. And future Goku says he saw the same vision. He's not sure what it means, but it could be related somehow. Although, it's strange. He says he only recently saw that vision. But that doesn't make sense. He's so far in the future. Goku and Raditz saw the vision very recently. And this future Goku, he's decades in the future. Why is he only seeing it just then? How far in the future were they seeing? This does confuse future Goku. It's concerning. Why is that little detail different here? Hopefully it doesn't mean too much. But maybe it does mean something. Maybe the timeline's been altered somehow. He doesn't know. But Goku says the main reason he's here is to change the past. They know they could change the future. And now he wants to see if they could change the past events too. He says they actually ended up defeating the androids. Surprisingly enough, not everyone died right away. Years into battle, they still couldn't win. They even tried training in the time chamber, but by the time they got there, the androids had followed them. They haven't been on Kami's lookout yet, but they know the location of it. It could be risky. If they end up going in the time chamber and getting trapped in there, by the androids destroying it or something, that could have been terrible. But there was something to push Goku over the edge. The androids killed the Saiyans first. Nappa, Raditz, Vegeta. Piccolo fell alongside them. Goku was too weak in the fight back. The rage he felt at his death again was immense. But not much later on, there was another death, someone that was way more brutal. Goku watched his other friends die. Yamcha, Tenshinhan, Chaozu. There still are other people alive, Yajirobe and Roshi. But Krillin was also one of the ones to survive longest, until the androids got to him, and the androids made it a point to make him suffer, just because they knew it would get to Goku. But this was a big mistake on their part. Goku watched this all unfold, unlocking a brand new power that he didn't even know was possible, and he decided it's easier to show it off to them. 
He says even if they found Namek's Dragon Balls in the future, it wouldn't erase what happened, the things that future Goku saw, all the years they've lost and such. But by doing this, they could change the outcome of everything, especially by showcasing this power. Future Goku powers up. His energy is incredibly intense. He's surrounded by sparks of electricity. It looks like Super Saiyan, but slightly different. He tells them, this is what he calls Super Saiyan 2. Future Goku stands there in this form. It doesn't look too much different from Super Saiyan, but they can immediately tell by the power that it definitely is something different. No wonder he unlocked it through rage. Goku reiterates, this was the form that allowed him to beat the androids. Of course, everybody back here in the past could actually seek out the androids right now, destroy them before they even become a problem. But just like what happened normally, especially since Goku and Raditz are probably going to be the ones to make the call here, they'll decide to leave the androids as is. It'll work as a great motivator, and on top of that, if they do get Super Saiyan 2, well that just tells them they'll be able to defeat the androids right away, even if it's only Goku that gets it. Future Goku powers down. He reminds them, he's much older than this other Goku. He has so many more years of experience behind him too. Not just that, but he knows how to utilize this form more. Of course, Super Saiyan 2 is powerful, and Goku recognizes that it might not be a surefire way to defeat the androids at this timeline, but he says it's still at least worth a shot. And future Goku kind of expected this. I mean, it's himself that he's talking to after all. He knows how he's going to react. Well, he trusts that they're in good hands, especially because now they know about the androids. In a few years' time when the androids actually do awaken, he'll come back here too, just to make sure that everything's going okay. It's a way for him to actually confirm that the future will change if something does change here. And it also acts as reassurance. If they somehow can't defeat the androids, well, once Goku comes back, he should be able to. It was tough fighting both of them together, even with Super Saiyan 2. But fighting them individually, he should be able to handle that. Especially now that he's going to spend a lot more time training, since they're not under threat in the future anymore. At least as far as he knows. There's still that weird premonition that they all had. But maybe they'll find out in due time. Especially since future Goku's working on crafting his premonition even further. If he knows exactly what to look for, he could do it. He is farther out after all. He didn't focus on it too much while he was fighting the androids. It's not like he really had the option, and when he did use it in fights, it helped him avoid significant attacks. And this tells present Goku too. It could be used for him in the way he was thinking, using it in battle short term, trying to figure out what opponents will do for their next move. It sounds vastly helpful. With future Goku returning, we enter a brief time skip with everybody training. And in this time skip, with Vegeta and Bulma still getting together, Trunks is born. This is the person that future Goku was hiding. He is alive in the future, but he just didn't want to mention it, for obvious reasons. The four Saiyans have especially been training hard. Vegeta and Nappa are becoming a little bit more cool-headed. It's not like they can do much anyways because Goku and Raditz are still above them, especially Goku. Raditz is eventually able to unlock Super Saiyan for himself. It takes a while, but they know to focus specifically on that, but he knows this still won't be enough if his future self is anything to judge by. And as for Vegeta and Nappa, they're doing their own thing. Goku even heard from his future self that Gohan apparently unlocks Super Saiyan in the future as well. He wonders how early he can unlock it here though. It might take a little bit more time. On the day the androids are supposed to arrive, the group is ready to encounter them. And of course, future Goku does return, this time with two extra friends, Gohan and Trunks. It takes them a bit to realize that it's Trunks, since future Goku never did mention him, but it's interesting to see that he's actually one of the survivors there. But also the fact that they're seeing an older Gohan. Future Gohan was mentioned, but seeing him in person is another thing. Future Goku says he brought these two just in case, and because they kind of did want to see this past timeline, especially Trunks wanting to see Vegeta. Although, Vegeta's still Vegeta, so he's not really the type to want to bond with his son or whatever. Oh well, Trunks has to at least see him. Just get to know him at least. The most surprising thing is that 19 and 20 are the first to show up. They are easily defeated, I mean especially with the group here and the fact that Goku's not going to fall to the heart virus, it's not going to be too tough. The most confusing thing to these two is the fact that there's two Gokus. The second Jiro sees this, he immediately tries to escape. He's defeated but uses 19 as a distraction, commanding him to self-destruct. This allows Jiro to slip away, getting back to his lab, activating 17 and 18. With these two on his side, he'll be able to win. At least, until they kill him. They track him down relatively quickly, with future Goku confirming that these are the two androids that he faced in his timeline. He doesn't know why those other two appeared, and that does concern him. It shows that the timeline has changed a bit, and he reminds them of the power that was needed to defeat these two androids. But the present fighters say they still want to face them. That's why they waited in the first place. Future Goku still does want to be safer rather than sorry, but he does tell them they can go for it. Future Gohan and Trunks are a bit surprised to hear this, but future Goku reminds them. In the event that there is an issue, they could just jump in and they know that they should be able to defeat the androids, especially with how much the androids are outnumbered. Just like the androids in the main story, these are a bit stronger, but not by a significant amount. With how many strong people we have in this group right now, especially with the future warriors here, they might all stand a chance. If future Goku sees anybody faltering, he'll join in and finish this. He doesn't want to have any deaths here. And future Gohan's on standby as well. Present Gohan's already met his future self, and he really wants to see how strong his future self is. All the present warriors power up, with Goku and Raditz at the forefront. They showcase Super Saiyan, with Vegeta and Nappa laughing. They've been waiting to showcase this. They've recently unlocked this form as well, with the two of them standing beside each other, powering up into their own Super Saiyan form. Goku and Raz are going to fight against Android 17, while Vegeta and Nappa will face Android 18. The two 2v1s commence. And even with Super Saiyan, Vegeta and Nappa are having a tough time. 
they're still pretty far behind Goku and Raditz. And 18 is pretty powerful. The same goes for Goku and Raditz versus 17, although they're faring pretty decently. This version of Goku is still a little bit above his normal self. And there's also the fact that he's even here fighting in general. With Raditz being around a similar strength, 17's actually having a tough time, while 18's not really having too difficult of a fight. Vegeta and Nappa are astounded. How are these low-class warriors so far ahead? The time travelers watch as the fight goes on. It's intriguing that Vegeta and Nappa were able to get Super Saiyan here at least, but more so, they're surprised at the power of Goku and Raditz. Future Goku even comments that he wasn't that strong beforehand. Well, he was still training, but this Goku was definitely training more seriously knowing the threats here. And present Goku yells over to him. He wants to make a wager. If he wins this fight without having the future warriors intervene, he wants to fight his future self one-on-one. -on -one. Future Goku laughs. He says that was inevitable regardless, but yeah, he'll accept that offer. Seventeen's pissed that they're acting so casually, but that's because Goku and Raditz actually have this in the back. With their combined full power, they're able to quickly destabilize Android 17. Just as a brief distraction, they then jump in to help Vegeta and Nappa. They are still having trouble with Android 18, and they're mad that the two brothers joined this fight, but at the same time kinda know that they need this. With the four of them fighting together, Android 18 is then completely defeated. 17 jumps back into the battle, but it's far too late now. With four Super Saiyans against him, he's defeated as well. With both androids dying to the Super Saiyans, and 16 never even being activated. Present Goku powers down, looking over at his future self, giving a thumbs up. And future Goku compliments all of them. He has to say, he's impressed. He knew that by giving them all this news, it would definitely give them a head start with power. But they exceeded his expectations. It's also interesting seeing his past self grow this strong. Unfortunately, they definitely haven't fixed any of their timeline yet. But it's okay. It's like they said, they just wanted to see if they could change the past. Bulma already put the work in for the time machine. Well, maybe they could still go to Namek or something, if they can end up finding the new one in general. The androids are already gone in the future, so Earth is at peace. It might be too late to restore everything. They already went through all that turmoil, and it's been so long since everybody's been gone. They've accepted their fate, but it was at least worth a shot to try and change the past. But they're not going to leave immediately. They still have a few things to do while they're here. For one, present Gohan goes up to his future self. He wants to see his power. He wants to see how strong he can grow, and if he can grow stronger sooner. Present Goku wants to see this power as well, with future Goku letting him on a little secret. Gohan actually might have surpassed him already. Wait, really? How? He hasn't even fought here. Goku says he's been training these two hybrid Saiyans to try and unlock Super Saiyan 2. Trunks trailed a bit behind Gohan because he is younger after all, and Gohan was actually one of the people training him too. Gohan actually unlocked Super Saiyan pretty early on, and once the androids were defeated, they worked together to achieve Super Saiyan 2. Future Gohan already saw what happened when his future was under threat once, and in case that happened again, he wanted to prevent it, with future Goku seeing his immense potential. And that's why present Gohan was so curious to see it. They don't really know much about how strong future Gohan is, or future Trunks for that matter. If Goku's going to compare his strength with his future self, Gohan kind of wants to as well, even though the disparity will be a lot larger there. Future Goku says he has an idea. Well, if they want to do something quickly, they could use the Room of Spirit in time. It's something that they did want to use in the future, as he's mentioned before. But they couldn't because the androids knew the location of it, and they didn't want anything bad happening with getting trapped in there or whatever. But here in this timeline, they could use it. He says the two Gohan should go in together. Maybe future Gohan could teach its past self to go Super Saiyan. And they actually really do like this idea, going into the Room of Spirit in time together eventually. And one of the reasons future Goku suggests this is because not only will it be good for past Gohan, but he's also still worried about the other premonition he had. And he asks his past self and Raditz, have they seen that same monster again? Because he actually has. The visions are becoming clearer. He's getting a better image of what that monster is, which means he's probably right around the corner, figuratively and literally. He could appear at any moment, whoever he is. And Goku and Raditz confirm, they've seen the same exact thing. And future Goku says it's very strange that he's seeing this too, which means it must be some sort of threat in this timeline. And that makes him wonder, could it be a threat in his timeline as well? I mean, because if that threat exists here, it should be in his timeline theoretically too. They still have no clue what it is, but they do know that sometime soon, this monster will appear. But in the meantime, Goku wants to test his strength with his future self. Raditz says his future self is a bum for not surviving. He would have loved to prove that he's the superior Raditz. And future Goku is not surprised to see that his brother is the same way that he's always been. But as for fighting his past self, he'd love to do that. There's a brief passage of time, and sometime early the next day, after they get some rest, the two of them get ready to fight with both powering up in the Super Saiyan. Goku asks himself to use a Super Saiyan 2 form. Future Goku says he will, as long as Goku pushes him into it. Goku takes this as a challenge. The two start dueling, and it's incredible, the power that they're both showcasing, even present Goku. Future Goku's surprised that his past self is this powerful, but he could tell, he still hasn't completely mastered Super Saiyan yet. And Goku comments, he was on his way there, he's already had it in mind, trying to use it at 100% efficiency, but he still feels like he's a long way from Super Saiyan 2. And Future Goku says he's not so sure, he knows about it now and knows what to aim for, so maybe he can achieve it. I mean, he's already getting the hang of Super Saiyan pretty well, almost at grade 4 even. Future Goku says he'll go in the time chamber with him as well if he wants to, and Goku says he'd love to. However, it might be better if he tries something on his own. Look how strong he's already gotten by being motivated like this. Sometimes the easiest way isn't the best way. Future Goku also kind of expected that response. 
he is talking to himself after all. As the two continue fighting, it's clear that Future Goku has the advantage, but Goku's not faltering. At least, until Future Goku goes Super Saiyan 2, completely wiping the floor with his past self. Goku's glad that he's finally showcasing this, and Future Goku's ready to land the finishing blow. But right as he's about to, there's a blinding flash of light. A solar flare. He thinks his past self launched it at him, but no. Present Goku's blinded too. The spectators watch on as someone else jumps in. And somehow while blinded, Future Goku's able to knock his past self out of the way, predicting an enemy attacking. He was too focused on the fight. He didn't even try to get any visions yet. And this one came to him at the right time. Imperfect Cell jumps in, trying to steal energy from present Goku. But instead, his tail hits Future Goku. He didn't know what was gonna happen either. Future Goku just knew that someone was gonna get attacked, so he wanted to protect his past self. And unbeknownst to him, this makes things worse, because now Cell's getting even more power. He's getting the strongest warrior here. Trunks powers up jumping in, swinging his sword at Cell. And Future Goku's laying there on the ground. He tells Trunks to watch for the tail. And just as he says that, Cell lunges his tail out. And Trunks barely dodges it, but the tail flies right past him, hitting present Goku, starting to steal his energy. Trunks is able to easily slice his tail off, with Cell screaming in pain, but it's fine. He immediately regenerates it. He thanks them for the power, and they ask who the hell he is. And Cell's unsure whether he should stay here or fight, but with the power that he just gained, he might be able to win, especially since two of the Gokus are knocked out. He simply asks where the androids are, and Raditz steps up, powering into Super Saiyan. He says he doesn't know or care who this ugly bastard is, but he'll entertain this question at least. The androids are dead. He's gonna have no luck in finding them because they already killed the androids. And Cell is fuming. He came back here for nothing. He thought the androids would still be around. That explains why Goku and Trunks are here. They're not supposed to be that old, at least not in this part of the timeline, unless those two are time travelers as well, from a separate timeline, not the one where he stole his time machine from. He knew something was off immediately when he saw two Gokus, but he says it's fine. He'll just get some snacks here in the present, and then he'll just take his time machine somewhere else, somewhere where he actually can find the androids. He'll have a little fun here while he's at it and then destroy the place. Raditz says he's not gonna get that far, with Vegeta and Nappa then standing alongside the other two Saiyans, also powering up. And this surprises Cell. Vegeta and Nappa are still here, and they're Super Saiyans. Good for them, but that's not going to be enough. Not nearly. Especially with the boosted power that he has now, he's more than confident. The fight rages on, with both Gokus there on the ground, trying to get back up. Present Goku didn't get as bad because Trunks intervened, although he's obviously still pretty beat up because he was fighting himself. Future Goku really wants to help, but he doesn't have the strength right now. If he could intervene, he could definitely help here. They need to rely on Trunks, he's on the cusp of Super Saiyan 2. If he unlocks it here, they could probably win, whoever this monster is. They could beat him and he yells out the trunks. He needs to harness that power, the same one that he was working for. And Vegeta tells him to not pay attention to that fool, pay attention to the fight, and harness that anger he has. Does he want this timeline to be doomed as well? Does he want to die here? Future Goku watches on kind of annoyed because he was about to give Trunks the same advice. But you know what? It's probably good that he hears it from Vegeta too. And Trunks tries to summon more power, with Cell fending off everyone pretty easily. But some object then flies really quickly into Cell, coated by a golden orb. It moves so quickly that they couldn't even see it, with Cell being launched away. But then it becomes clear what it is. Actually, who it is. It's not an object. It's Gohan. Kid Gohan. He's a Super Saiyan. They just got out of the time chamber. Both Gokus are really glad to see this. And at the same time, future Gohan arrives as well. He's glad to see everyone's okay. And sorry they took so long. But their training was successful. And he tells them that he could sense Trunks' power rising. So he looks over at Trunks, saying they're all going to finish this together. The three hybrid Saiyans. They could harness their anger all at once and defeat whatever this monster is. Trunks nods. With Gohan also looking over at his past self. He tells him, Get ready to utilize everything that he learned in the time chamber. Present Gohan's a bit nervous, but he nods. Future Gohan's the first to power up, surrounded by sparks of electricity, showing off that same Super Saiyan 2 form that Future Goku had. And Cell stumbles back, a bit surprised at the surge in power. And he tells the other two, harness their anger, utilize it for the power that they need. He knows both of them are capable of it. He's trained both, and he knows them better than pretty much anybody, especially his past self. He knows they have the power in them to do this. The three all fight Cell together, and he can't keep up. Even Gohan alone would be a problem for him. But with the three of them together, he has no hope at winning, which is why future Gohan sees this as perfect practice for the other two. And he tells them, coordinate this attack with him. Cell launches towards them, but then is held in place by some rings of energy. Raditz used some of his strength to throw these over, trying to bind Cell for just a bit. And then there's a solar flare. Present Goku was barely able to perform this. And Cell is there, bound by Raditz's attack and blinded by Goku's. Future Gohan shouts, now is the time. Together, the three all charge a Masenko, a timeless Masenko. A powerful attack spanning both timelines with two versions of Gohan. And at the very last second, there's a surge in power from Trunks. Those same sparks of electricity surround him. For a brief moment, he goes into Super Saiyan 2. And together, the three of them eliminate Cell, leaving nothing left, not even knowing about his regeneration. But it doesn't matter, he's completely gone now. Both Gokus are healed. Glad that it turned out that way, and proud of both Gohans, and Trunks as well. With Vegeta surprised to see that Trunks got that powerful. Trunks still may have a tough time getting the form, but at least he knows he can attain it, even if he only got it briefly. And now, present Gohan's aiming for this too. He thinks he can accomplish it, and future Gohan thinks he can too. 
Together, he and Goku will work towards this. Hell, maybe even Raditz will try. They thank the future warriors, and the future warriors thank them. It seems that Cell Guy wasn't too much of a threat. They were able to handle it pretty easily, even with the handicaps they were given. And now, the three warriors head home, knowing to watch for their own version of Cell as well, who they eventually encounter and defeat pretty easily. They might have not restored their timeline fully, but they saved another, and their Earth is still at peace. And more importantly, that present Earth will never know the destruction that they saw. The androids have all been stopped. Goku immediately starts focusing on his short-term visions again, trying to get more of a control over it. He knows this will be very useful in battle, and his training has been working kinda, but he and Raditz have the same issue. They're not incredibly accurate just yet, but Goku knows he's almost there. He can just use this during battle whenever he feels. Meanwhile, Raditz is gonna decide to focus on his long-term skills. Given everything that's happened to him so far, he's a little bit more paranoid than Goku, and would rather see bad things happen before they happen, and figure out ways to avoid them so he's prepared. Goku would rather be spontaneous with it, learning how to adapt his visions in his fights, but Raditz thinks it's better to just prevent the fights in the first place, or at least know a path to victory right off the bat before he gets into these battles. So they are still focusing on their foresight, but just with different time frames in mind. But it's not just that. With Goku around, since he didn't die in the Cell Saga, of course he's still going to be there for Gohan. And after seeing the performance of future Gohan, and with Gohan even training with future Gohan, Goku's definitely going to be working way more with Gohan, trying to get him to tap more into that power. Gohan's interested too. His future self got that Super Saiyan 2 form now, and he thinks it might be fun to train for. After spending a year with his future self, he has a bit of a different outlook. Of course, he still does want to be a scholar. Hell, his future self did want to be that way too. But knowing how bad things got in his future, and how his future self got robbed of all these opportunities, Gohan wants to prevent any of that from happening. Of course, the androids are gone, but who knows what other threats will be there. Gohan knows his potential. His future self showed him it. He knows what he's capable of, and he knows what he's responsible for. He should be using this power for good, and he should keep up with that training. He'll find that nice balance too. He'll be able to study all he wants, become a scholar like he wants, but at the same time, he'll be powerful. And with the great guidance of Goku there, that's definitely gonna help a lot. We go about a year after the Cell Saga. Gohan by now actually has access to Super Saiyan 2, with Goku just on the cusp of it. Raditz is of course following up as well, but he started being more solitary training on his own. He's focused on his own strength, while Goku's more focused on building himself up and Gohan up. And of course, they do have different things that they're training for. But something interesting has happened with Raditz too. Vegeta and Nappa are associating with him more. He surpassed them already, and they want to get ahead of him. Raditz does kind of get an ego boost from being above them too. And while they're too prideful to admit it, they do want to learn more from him. Same goes for Goku, but he's too preoccupied with Gohan. So they train a lot with Raditz, growing stronger on their own too. But with Raditz still focused on his foresight, he eventually does actually get some sort of vision that could be useful, and he immediately tells Goku what it is. It's something that Goku hasn't even foreseen, but when he's prompted to look into it, he actually can kind of see it. They see some magician, a few years out from now. Raditz sees it clearer because that's exactly what he's been training for. They see themselves at a tournament, with someone stealing energy from them. And then they see a pink monster, not knowing who or what it is. They can't get an exact time frame, but they know that's a few years out from now. Although Raditz notes something interesting. In this vision, he's able to find some sort of relative location for where they were fighting. And in this area where they did fight that magician, he sees some sort of weird spaceship. And he gets an idea. What if they were to seek out this area, just so they knew where the spaceship was going to land, and they stop the threat before it even occurs? Well, Goku definitely likes that idea. And they don't know exactly when this guy's going to land here, but they might as well try and scope it out. So they're going to head over to the area where the spaceship's supposed to land. They have a general area, but they just need to know exactly where it's going to be. And that way, they can try and keep it under watch maybe, and when this guy lands, they'll be prepared, being able to immediately find a spaceship. That doesn't seem too bad. They get a little group together actually. It's them two and Gohan. Raditz gives them all the info we could find, giving ideas of what different landmarks are around that area. They're going to survey this general area and find the exact spot where he's going to land. But Vegeta and Nappa eventually catch on to it too. And this is going to be kind of weird for Raditz and Goku to explain because they don't really want to give away that they have those premonitions. They still don't want Vegeta and Nappa knowing because they're not sure what they're going to do with that information. And mainly because Raditz doesn't want to give his trump card up to them. And also the fact that he basically has a real life cheat code. So they kind of skirt around and say they're just searching for something. They feel like there's something strange going on. And they just want to look in that area just to make sure everything's okay. Which kind of is true, but Vegeta and Nappa are a little bit suspicious. They're going to come along with them. They want to see what's going on. Well, you know what? That's fine. Although these two Saiyans aren't really going to be too helpful with searching, since Raditz can't give away what he's actually looking for because then he'll give away that he has that foresight. Very strange situation, but he'll work around it. So they go over to that general area, and they all start looking around. Goku and Gohan split up from Raditz, while Raditz stays with the other two Saiyans. And it doesn't take too long before they find something. Raditz, Vegeta, and Nappa are the first to locate it. There actually is a spaceship here. This guy's already on the planet. How long has he been here for? How long does he plan on staying here for? Raditz tries focusing, trying to communicate with Goku to get him over here. He doesn't want to alert anyone else, but it's already too late. He tells Goku and Gohan where he is, but someone then jumps out to attack him. Raditz immediately powers up in his Super Saiyan, narrowly dodging as someone spits at him. Disgusting. Why is this guy spitting on him? It's Deborah. 
He saw them over there. He and Bobadir are concerned. They've been spotted. It must just be by chance. There's no way they actually know what's going on here. Deborah can at least fend them off. But there is kind of an issue with this. Deborah can't kill them just yet. Bobbity wants to collect energy from them. Deborah just has to hold them off somehow. Bobbity is scrambling to try and figure out something to do. They shouldn't have been spotted right now. This is really going to mess with his plans. There's no way they could revive Boo this early. Unless... Wait, he has an idea. There might just be enough power here. Deborah can fight against these Saiyans. And he could sense two other people too, Goku and Gohan. If those two come over here, that could really help him get some more energy. Especially Gohan. He seems strong. But still, he needs to make sure he could buy time. If Deborah dies and they can't have a good enough fight, Bobbity's not going to collect enough energy. He has to figure out another way to do this. As Goku comes over, he feels uneasy. He turns over to Gohan. He tells him, go into Super Saiyan 2. Don't hold anything back. And Gohan's a bit confused. What's going on? Goku says they're fighting a strong enemy. He can see it. Moments from now, they'll encounter him. But it shouldn't be an issue. Gohan could defeat him. With ease, actually. He tells Gohan, now's the time to use that power. Exactly what he was training for. When they get over there, they're going to see a demonic looking guy. He needs Gohan to defeat him as quickly as possible. Gohan's a little bit nervous, but he nods. Immediately powering up into Super Saiyan 2, rocketing over towards the area. Goku goes Super Saiyan and follows close behind. Raditz, Vegeta, and Nappa are all transformed right now, facing off against Deborah. He's trying to stall it, and he could spit on them to try and freeze someone, but he's not actually going to do that, because then he won't be able to draw out any energy from them. He could do that once the other two arrive. Although, this isn't going to go as he planned. Amidst his battle, someone else rockets in, landing a direct hit on Deborah, sending him flying far away. It's Gohan, with the other three Saiyans seeing that he's fully powered up. Goku arrives over not long after. He turns to the rest of them, telling them to go inside the ship. At the bottom floor, Bobbity's there. They could defeat him and stop this. Bobbity? Who the hell's that? And Goku says not to question it, but Raditz knows exactly what happened. Goku had a vision. He saw short-term. He knows a way to win this. Raditz's long-term vision allowed them to actually stop this threat before it happened, while Goku, his short-term visions can allow him to adapt here, helping the group be flexible and secure victory. Raditz flies right towards the ship, bursting through the top of it and going down. Vegeta and Nappa are just completely confused, but they decide to follow along. Deborah launches back over, ready to face Gohan once more. And Goku watches alongside him. He's not going to get involved in the fight, because something's telling him not to. He knows that here, he shouldn't give off too much energy. Something feels wrong about it. Some instinct within him is telling him not to do so. It might be part of his foresight. He's not sure. But he focuses on the ship, trying to sense what's happening. And something strange occurs. It doesn't seem like the three of them are getting much lower in the ship. Actually, it looks like they stopped. And Vegeta and Nappa's power. It's changed. It's spiked, actually. Goku's stomach drops. Something's wrong. He rushes over to where Raditz is. And Raditz bursts at the top of the ship, looking over at Goku and yelling at him. He tells Goku to watch out. Something's wrong with Vegeta and Nappa. They rocket up back to the surface, following behind Raditz. And the two try to attack Raditz together. But Goku jumps in, blocking one of them. Raditz clashes with Nappa, and Goku clashes with Vegeta. The two brothers jump back, and the other two Saiyans jump back as well, with the four of them floating above Bobbity's ship. Something's different about Vegeta and Nappa. Their powers are way higher, and it feels more malicious than normal. And on their forehead, they could see the letter M there for some reason. Gohan looks over, nervous about what's going on, but he doesn't question. Goku told them to fight this guy, so he will. He'll help them in a bit. This fight shouldn't take too long. Raditz asks Goku what's going on, but Goku says he's not sure. He didn't see this, but... For now, all he has as an idea is just split up and fight each of them. Vegeta and Nappa are stronger, but the two of them, they still can win. Maybe they'll match these two in terms of power. Goku says he'll take on Vegeta, and he tells Raditz to fight Nappa. They'll figure out what's going on later, and you guys could probably already tell what's happened. Bobbity has taken control of them. Or rather, they allow themselves to fall under Bobbity's spell. And this is the birth of Majin Vegeta and Majin Nappa. This is their chance to surpass the other two Saiyans. Their chance to get stronger and defeat them. And it works for Bobbity too, because this is a way for him to get even more energy and stall a little longer. This way it might actually work. Deborah is fighting Gohan now, although he knows Deborah is going to lose. Pui Pui and Yakan have already been defeated by the three Saiyans, but now they're all fighting and Goku's joined in too. All Bobbity needs to do is wait a little bit longer and then catch Gohan off guard. He could steal energy from Gohan that way too. Siphoning off power directly from Gohan and still getting energy from the fight between the Majins and the two brothers. This could actually work. Even though he's unprepared, he could probably revive Buu even earlier than he thought. As Goku and Raditz fend off the other two, Gohan's fight with Deborah concludes. It wasn't too tough. He actually exceeds Deborah's power right now, and Deborah's surprised that a kid could be this strong, and Gohan's not holding anything back either. It's like he saw with his future self. His future self warned him about a few things. One, don't slack off. Use that gift of his to his fullest. And two, don't get cocky. Even though he does have that great strength, he shouldn't let it get to his head. He's not infallible, and if he messes up somewhere, it could affect others too, not just him. Future Gohan does know himself better than anyone after all. And all this applies to present Gohan too. He takes the fight serious, defeating Deborah and actually killing him. Bobbity panics. Okay, he could recover from this. He still could take energy from everyone else. Buu will be revived. Amidst his battle with Vegeta, 
Goku tries to still utilize this short-term foresight, and it actually does kind of work surprisingly. He predicts some of Vegeta's moves, dodging them flawlessly, or parrying them flawlessly, and Vegeta's confused. He knows Goku's an excellent fighter, but this is different. It's almost like his body's reacting on its own or something, and at some point it's like he knows exactly what Vegeta's gonna do before he even thinks of doing it. But before Vegeta can even question anything, Gohan then flies in to help Goku, and the two of them actually knock out Vegeta together. Goku thanks Gohan. He kinda didn't want to handle it himself, but it's safer this way too. It's like he told Gohan, finish this quick. He doesn't know what's gonna happen if they don't finish it quick, but he knows it's not gonna be good. Whatever that magician is planning, it has something to do with that pink monster that Raditz saw. The father-son duo rushes over to Raditz, helping him defeat Nappa. Raditz was already not having too tough of a time, but this just turns the tides way too quickly. And as a last ditch effort, while the three are fighting Nappa, Babidi teleports in, trying to stab Gohan and take energy from him, but Gohan's far too quick. Turning around quick and slicing his arm at Babidi. Babidi puts his shield up, but it isn't enough. Gohan cuts right through it, and quickly Goku throws over a key blast, eradicating Babidi. Goku, Gohan, and Raditz descend to the ground, with Vegeta and Nappa down there unconscious. And Raditz asks, out of curiosity, what would have happened there if they didn't win? Well, Goku doesn't know, and that M disappears from both Vegeta and Nappa's foreheads. And Goku notes something interesting. Both of them have seen different visions of the future. Of course, they're focused at different lengths of time. Goku's more focused on the short term, being able to see that more clearly, while Raditz, he can see the future more clearly, things that are farther away, preventing things from happening before they happen. But Goku says it's kind of just like before. Even when they see certain things, that may cause other bad events to happen. They can change the future, but they have to be careful. Because see what happened here. They didn't prevent whatever was supposed to happen from happening, but at the same time, they caused whatever this is. Vegeta and Nappa got possessed, and it almost led to something terrible. It's an interesting thing to note. It's a double-edged sword. They can stop stuff from happening, but they can also cause other things to happen. They already kind of knew this, but this just confirms what they already thought. But they'll definitely start being more careful with it. It's a good thing they were able to adapt here, and prevent Boo from being revived. Vegeta and Nappa wake up, and Raditz calls them idiots. How did they get possessed? It didn't even seem like they were being controlled. And as they continue arguing, Raditz is able to easily find out. They got possessed purposefully, just to be stronger, just so they could fight these two. And even then, they still lost. Raditz calls them morons. They could have put everyone at risk. They could have destroyed everything. They don't know what they were playing with. But then he starts laughing. If they really do want to grow that strong, growing stronger than him, just train under him. They've already been doing it for so long, and they just need to follow his guidance. The two are angered that he even suggests that, especially Vegeta. He's the leader here. He's the elite Saiyan. But Raditz questions that. He's above both of them right now. And the Saiyans almost start fighting again, but Goku jumps in and tries to calm everyone down. And Raditz says for what it's worth, he wasn't trying to rile them up. He actually meant it. They could train under him if he wants. Vegeta hates the idea of that. He's not a low-class warrior. He shouldn't be under Raditz. But as for Nappa, he actually thinks maybe he could benefit from this. Besides, he needs to surpass Raditz again, and he thinks that's possible. He can't be a subordinate. Although Raditz tells them he has some things pretty intense in mind. He's going to actually leave Earth, going somewhere else to try new methods of training. He's not sure exactly where, but he knows Earth might actually be limiting him. He's not too sure. And Goku's surprised to hear this too. It's the first time he heard of it, and Raditz begins explaining more. We skip a few days ahead. Raditz has actually been planning this for a while. He's gonna go out somewhere else. Earth was never meant to be a permanent place for him, and he's had a good time here, but he still is a Saiyan at heart. This place is too soft for him to train in, and it seems Nappa's actually gonna go along with him. Vegeta, of course, decided against that, and even if he did want to go out into space, he probably wouldn't because he'd rather stay here with his family. He is starting to warm up to Bulma and Trunks after all. Goku tells Raditz it's been fun having him over here. They've grown a lot stronger together and Raditz laughs. He says Earth isn't too fitting for him, and Nappa could probably agree. They say Vegeta's at least assimilated a bit, and he gets mad at this. He's still a Saiyan at heart. Yeah, whatever. They could tell he's starting to become a softie. But Raditz says this isn't the last time Kakarot will see him. He'll be back eventually. They've done some great things together, and they could probably do some more great things. He sticks a hand out to his brother, and this reminds Goku of the first time they met, but this time it's under very different circumstances. And without hesitation, he shakes his brother's hand, smiling. He says farewell to Raditz, saying he hopes to meet him again soon. And Nappa says farewell to Vegeta. Vegeta doesn't really care too much about this, but Goku's optimistic about it. This could work out for the bet. But he wonders where his brother's gonna go to. And before Raditz leaves, he looks over to Gohan too. He tells him he's a great example of a good Saiyan. And he tells his nephew, continue making use of that great power. And he looks back up at Goku, telling him to do the same thing. And Goku knows exactly what he means, referring to that same foresight that they both have. Raditz and Nappa board their ships, with no particular destination to mind just yet. But they'll figure something out. Now, things are going to kind of speed up a bit, because the first thing we encounter is a major time skip. Remember, the Boo Saga did happen earlier, so that time skip's going to happen too. Although, it's going to change a bit, and the events that follow it are going to change too, but I'll explain in a bit. For now, let's discuss what actually happens over this time skip. Raditz and Nappa first seek out Planet Serial. Nappa wonders why he's even going there, but Raditz needs to find the answers behind why he has this ability. Although, he still is kind of hiding it from Nappa, but he knows that he's probably going to have to come clean about it soon. For now, he just says he knows that somebody's there. 
someone plotting against the Saiyans, which is true, he's foreseen the heaters. But he knows this is where he needs to go. It's what he was told on Namek when he learned about his past. And here, maybe he could find the Namekian who made those Dragon Balls and figure out what kind of wish was made. The two of them arrive on planet Sirio, and almost immediately, they're attacked. Raditz didn't foresee this, but that must mean this guy's not too big of a threat. He saw that the heaters would be here, and he knows he'll find his answers here. But he didn't learn about this guy. Of course, it's Granola. He hasn't made his wish yet, so he's actually not that strong compared to them. Although, his abilities do help him fight off the two Saiyans. And once he recognizes that they are Saiyans, he fights a lot more seriously too. But amidst the fight, he asks Granola, does he know anything about an Amekian on this planet? Granola lies about it, trying to hide Monaito's existence. But Raditz says he already knows that there was an Amekian here. One who still may be here. Someone who created the Dragon Balls. He's not here to actually use the Dragon Balls, he just wants to find his creator. Asking him a question about someone that made a wish a while ago. Granola doesn't really know how to respond about this. Apparently this guy does actually know about Monaito. But he's not going to trust Raditz that easily. This guy could easily be lying to him. So Raditz thinks about what to do next. He has an idea. Smiling as he makes a wager with Granola. This guy probably doesn't like the heaters, right? From what Raditz understands, they used to work with the Frieza Force. The Saiyans did too, but the Saiyans hate Frieza. Oh yeah, and he tells Granola he took part in killing Frieza, even though that was mostly Goku. And he thinks these heaters should go too. He'll take care of the heaters for Granola if he helps him. And Granola has no idea of what to think about all this. This guy's a Saiyan, but also he's apparently responsible for killing Frieza? And now he's saying he'll get rid of the heaters? Granola uses his sight to try and study Raditz further. His heart rate hasn't changed. He's not sweating. There's no signs of him lying or being nervous. He's still cautious, but he tells Raditz, if he can go kill the heaters, he'll lead him to the creator of the Dragon Balls. And Raditz turns to Nappa. This shouldn't be too hard. Granola calls them here, saying there's some threat, coming up with a story to get them to come here. And the heaters eventually do arrive, with Raditz and Nappa ambushing them. The two immediately power up, going into Super Saiyan 2, a form that they now have access to. They didn't immediately go to Serio. They've had some training in the meantime. That's the whole point of Raditz going out into space after all, wanting to train on different planets. And the two of them are easily able to kill the heaters. Nappa doesn't even question it. Well, there shouldn't be any remains of Frieza's former allies. This whole situation's pretty weird, and he wonders how Raditz even knew about that. But whatever, they're an ally of Frieza's, so he doesn't mind eliminating them. But why is Raditz here in the first place? What questions is he going to ask this Namekian? Is he actually going to get the Dragon Balls for himself and ask for immortality? Well, Raditz can't really hide it from Nappa any longer. And he decides to explain to Granola too, just so he's more trusted. And Nappa can't believe it. He's kind of mad that Raditz hid this from them for so long. That could have been really useful in battles for them. And Raditz says he was using it in battles, ever since he was a kid. But he never really knew the origin of it. He hid it from Nappa and Vegeta for so long. First because he didn't really want to give them the info, and then later on because he's been lying about it for so long that it would be weird to tell them by now. Well, while Nappa processes all this, they're led to Manaido. Granola's just as dumbfounded and thanks them for defeating the heaters. Finally, now Raditz can get his answers. And he learns about Barok's involvement here. His father was here, and that's how he made the wish, and that's the wish he made. Manaido doesn't know the exact details of the wish, just what kind of wish was made. He doesn't know what happened after the fact, but he's able to theorize. And that just confirms it for Raditz. This ability of his, it was transferred to him and Goku by his dad. It's all Bardock's doing. Well, at least he knows more about it now. That's one mystery solved. He'll have to tell Kakarot about this one day. But for the time being, he's going to resume some different training. That's not all that happens over this time skip. Piccolo's still kind of off on his own. He doesn't really know what to do right now. He is kind of a good guy, but also still off on his own. He's not really part of the group. Piccolo never had that same crucial development that he originally had. He never fused the Kami either. As far as we're concerned, he's still Piccolo Jr., the reincarnation of King Piccolo. He's working at surpassing Goku in any way possible. Say it or not, Piccolo will find a way to defeat him. Although it's not really a I want to kill you rivalry, it's more of just a I want to be stronger than you rivalry. Piccolo still needs to prove himself somehow, and he has to train intensely for this. He knows what he's getting into. As for Goku himself, he ends up leaving Earth as well, although for a much different reason. He eventually consults Kami, seeing if he has any other ways to train him. He remembers as a kid when he used to go up the ladder in terms of training. Roshi, Korin, Kami. Are there any other gods above him? And Kami says there definitely are. Remember, Goku doesn't even know about Shin or Kibito because he never met them in the Buu Saga. But Kami decides to send Goku to King Kai, with the two of them formally meeting each other now. And King Kai's amazed at this guy's strength. He wonders if he could even teach him anything. He crossed Snake Way so quickly, and he's already powerful as is. But maybe he can learn some of King Kai's techniques. You know, the Spirit Bomb, the Kaioken. This guy might have the potential to do so. Goku spends some time training here, and eventually feels like someone's going to arrive soon. He has a vision of it. And that's because Beerus actually ends up waking up earlier than normal. It's due to his dream being different. His dream occurs earlier. And it disturbs his nap because of the prophecy that's in it. And it's not like the Super Saiyan God. It's not something that he immediately forgets and needs to refresh his memory about. He turns to Whis, telling him about the dream. There's a mortal out there. A future rival of his. One who could actually surpass him. And Whis wonders how that's possible. And Beerus says it's because this mortal, the one that he dreamt of, 
he had access to Ultra Instinct. And this intrigues Whis. Really? Ultra Instinct? It must have just been a silly dream, but Beerus is sure that it's a prophecy. And he remembers this mortal being a Saiyan, maybe. They immediately begin their search, with Whis finding one on King Kai's planet, actually. Which leads Beerus and Whis to go there. King Kai doesn't even try to hide Goku this time. Goku's actually the one to warn King Kai of Beerus arriving. Which surprises King Kai. How did he know about Beerus? Well, Goku filled King Kai in about his ability and said he foresaw it. And he knows he's gonna face Beerus. So when Beerus arrives, Goku's not even surprised, greeting him. But Beerus is surprised. It's almost like this mortal knew that he was gonna come here. And he asked, does he know why he's here? Goku doesn't really have an idea. But he knows that Beerus does want to test his power. And Goku would definitely be glad to fight him. Goku powers up starting to cycle through his forms, first with Super Saiyan, then Super Saiyan 2, and then a new stage beyond it. He almost tapped into Super Saiyan 3, but felt it was too draining to be efficient. He actually powers back down into Super Saiyan, and then stacks Kaioken on top of it. This is also incredibly draining too, but he's also at the beginning process of doing this. And he feels eventually one day he might be able to stack Kaioken with Super Saiyan 2, and basically make a better version of Super Saiyan 3 on his own. And this intrigues Beerus. This mortal's definitely smart. He seems to have a great grasp on how to control different powers. But he notices something strange about Goku's fighting style. His strength is nowhere near Beerus's level, but the way he's fighting, he could tell when Beerus is about to attack, predicting it, trying to parry it, even if it might not work. And there are points when Beerus attacks where his speed is just too much for Goku to counter. But he could tell that Goku still knew where he was going to attack. And he asks Goku, how is he able to do this? Goku comes clean, knowing that he can't hide this from the God of Destruction. Interesting. So this mortal has the ability to prophesize things, actually short term too. And Beerus laughs. That's actually the same reason he came here. He had a prophecy in his dream, although it wasn't nearly as lucid as this mortal is describing. And Goku asked what that prophecy was, and he said that he foresaw some sort of rival, a mortal that would have a power beyond his, one referred to as Ultra Instinct. What Goku's doing isn't too far fetched from it. His body reacts to things before it happens. Beerus can tell he's on the right track, although he's still doing all these movements consciously. And he tells Goku, if he can get these movements to be unconscious, he'll be the strongest mortal in existence. Hell, he could surpass the gods, maybe. He doesn't even think of Super Saiyan God here, he's just focused on this mortal getting Ultra Instinct, and it definitely seems like he could possibly do that. Goku's elated to hear this, and asks Beerus what the next steps will be. How can he get this power? King Kai is just as amazed. This mortal's pretty crazy, not just in terms of his power either. He's already friendly with Beerus. Of all people, Beerus! Beerus never ends up going to Earth. Instead, he just meets Goku here, taking him to his planet, where he's going to start training under Beerus and Whis. Goku thanks King Kai for the time training. And now, Goku's going to be ascending to a brand new level. He doesn't get Super Saiyan God right away, because that's not even what Beerus prophesies. They don't even know about it. But sometime down the line, Goku actually is able to unlock it inadvertently. He does need to get an access to Godly Key after all, and Beerus thinks this could somehow help him. Especially because at one point, Goku foresees something completely different. Him coded in intense red aura. It's fiery almost, with Beerus being amazed at the power. Okay, so he probably has to work on Kyo Ken. He spends a lot of time working on that. And he does improve it significantly, being able to use it at higher levels, and not getting as injured by it. But maybe that's not actually what he was seeing. Maybe it was something completely different, and the color was the only similar thing about it. Because the one thing he remembers from that vision is the aura. And no matter what he does with Kyo Ken, the aura doesn't change. It's the same one that he has with that. With that vision that he had, he saw flames. It was a fierce key surrounding him. The shape of the aura, the way it flowed, it didn't look like any of his forms or techniques that he currently has. And Beerus wonders if it's something godly. They have the oracle fish there too, someone else who knows about the future. And he helps Goku out. Well, maybe this is a godly power that he's unlocking. Alright, well, that does it. They start training for that. With Goku eventually unlocking Super Saiyan God, passively getting access to Godly Key from all the time he's been training here. And this amazes Beerus even more. He has a godly form, and not only that, but he's training for Ultra Instinct. This mortal really is something else, and he's very glad that he found it. And remember, Battle of Gods happened much earlier too, a few years earlier than normal. So, Goku has a lot of time training here. And it's not like everybody else is up to nothing too. We'll get to them in a little bit. At some point though, Goku does have to return to Earth. There is a vision he has of some of the Frieza Force coming back and using the Dragon Balls. So from what Goku can tell, they found Earth and they're going to try to revive Frieza. He's able to stop it, obviously. He gets back to Earth right before they do so, wiping out the rest of the Frieza Force and preventing Resurrection F. But with this brief return, there's a lot of questions for him. Mainly from Vegeta. Where the hell has Goku been? He spent time training a lot. He's unlocked Super Saiyan 2 and even went beyond it, getting Super Saiyan 3. And Goku's pretty impressed with that. Oh, he actually got that same thing too but decided it wasn't really too worthwhile. And Vegeta kind of expected as such. They both know the downside. So did Gohan because he also got it too. Although, Goku's pretty surprised that Vegeta was training with Gohan. Well, Gohan was still decently motivated here. And Vegeta needed some strong training partner. So why not a fellow Saiyan, especially one who was stronger than him? Goku didn't realize. It's been so long since he last saw Vegeta. He's come back to Earth now and again, seeing his family and such. 
But this is the first time he actually came back to Earth and fought somebody. And Vegeta was able to sense that power immediately coming over. And Vegeta's stomach drops when he hears that Goku's been acquainted with Lord Beerus. He's actually training under Whis with Lord Beerus. And Goku says if he wants to meet them, they're here too. That's how he got here. And Vegeta sees Beerus and Whis nearby, immediately being terrified. Well, he asks what he's been training for. Why is he training with them? What could he have possibly gotten that impressed Beerus that much? Goku says he probably won't be able to sense it, but he could still show it to Vegeta. With him going into Super Saiyan God. Although, this is only the first stage of power that he's got. It's been a while and he's already gone beyond it as he then transforms once more, turning into Super Saiyan Blue. In this time that he's been gone, Goku's unlocked two new forms with godly powers that Vegeta doesn't even know about. He can't even sense them, and he's fuming, but he wants them too. And Goku can tell that he does want to train for this power. So, Goku decides to ask Beerus, can Vegeta come along with them? It would be great for him to have a nice training partner after all, especially if he helps Vegeta transform too. Hell, while he's at it, he could probably get Gohan to come there. Although, he has tried that before in his past visits to Earth, and Gohan didn't actually really want to go, since he does want to stay here. Beerus reluctantly accepts it because, yeah, it could benefit him. Vegeta is way behind Goku, but now he's actually aiming for something new. But Goku wonders, where have Raditz and Nappa gone? It's been so long since he's seen them, and he asks Vegeta, have they returned to Earth at all? And Vegeta says no, he hasn't seen them in a while. Well, Goku's sure they'll show up one day. Besides, Raditz probably already knows about this power. But he does wonder where they've been and what they've been up to. What have they been trying to access in terms of strength? And there's one last brief time skip, in between Battle of Gods and up to the Universe 6 tournament. This one's a few years instead of just about a year or so. And now it's time for them to choose a team. Goku and Vegeta are the obvious picks, and Goku wonders if he should choose Gohan or Piccolo. He knows Piccolo's heavily been keeping up with his training, and he hasn't seen the guy in a while, wondering what he's been doing. But instead, Goku ends up recruiting Gohan for the team, finding out that in the time that they've been gone, Gohan needed a new training partner. He has been kind of keeping up with his training here and there, and surprisingly, that training partner he found was Piccolo. Now remember, again, Piccolo's not really close with anyone here. He doesn't have that same bond with Gohan that he has normally. They barely know each other. But here, out of necessity, the two decided they should train with each other. They're both strong, although Gohan is way ahead of Piccolo. And this training could really help them. Oh, so that's perfect. They could recruit Gohan and Piccolo. And then for the fifth member, maybe they could just find Krillin or somebody else. But then two people appear out of nowhere. It's Raditz and Nappa. And Goku's elated. He knew they'd show up eventually, but how did they appear? They don't have a spaceship. Well, Raditz says he knew to come back here. Okay, that's pretty obvious, but how did he get back here? They've been to different planets out in space, trying to train on different locations. You know, planets with higher gravity, planets with intense environments, and planets that probably have unique techniques, which led them to planet Yardrat, a place that Raditz vaguely knew about. Nappa even suggested it too. They have some strange techniques there. And since Raditz has his own strange technique, maybe the two of them can work together. Who knows what the Yardrats are capable of? Although, nothing he learned there really helped him with his foresight, and Raditz's foresight is already good enough. He's pretty good at seeing things long-term, and he's now working on the short-term like Goku was. But they did still learn some interesting things there, mainly about spirit control, which means they have instant transmission. Piccolo decides that he's not going to be on the team. He'd rather watch the Saiyans fight. He wants to see what they've all been up to, getting more intelligent than them. He hasn't seen any of them for a while, including Goku, and he doesn't know what they're capable of. The best way to gauge his power against them is to just watch from the stands, which lets Raditz and Nappa join the team. Although, Piccolo doesn't really get to do much watching because the tournament goes by pretty quickly. Universe 7 was lucky enough to have Goku go up first because he's easily able to defeat all his opponents. Yeah, and Frost isn't a problem either because he will know that Frost is going to try to poison him. He actually calls Frost out. But instead of Frost forfeiting, Goku still fights him and just wins the old-fashioned way. The most interesting opponent to him is Hit, but he knows Hit's ability. He knows he could time skip, and this makes Hit concerned. How does this guy know about him and his abilities? Goku says it's a long story, but he knows a way to counter this guy. He immediately powers up into Super Saiyan Blue. This might actually be too much because he's a lot stronger with Super Saiyan Blue than normal. Remember, he's been training with Beerus for so much longer than normal that he's way past where he was, even if he didn't go in the room of Spirit in time for three years before this tournament. As Hit starts attacking, Goku's able to perfectly dodge and parry all of his attacks. And Shampa looks at Beerus in disbelief. That can't be what he thinks it is, is it? And Beerus says it isn't, but this mortal definitely is on the path to Ultra Instinct. And this is a good showcase of it, fighting an opponent that can manipulate time. Goku's still moving his body consciously, but there are some movements that are unconscious. And there are brief instances where his aura flares up, changing vaguely. Beerus is on the edge of his seat, waiting for Goku to try something different. But it never happens. He's able to defeat Hit, pretty easily in fact. Even with the time skip, that's not an issue. But he meets with Beerus after the tournament. He could tell, he's almost there. He's almost got a hang of this power. He'll be able to use it unconsciously. And then, he'll truly become Beerus' rival. Well, he didn't unlock Ultra Instinct yet, but Beerus could tell that he's on the track too. And he's elated. Before we continue in the present timeline, what's happening in the future timeline? It's been a bit since we covered them, and a couple of things have changed. Well, obviously this future timeline is starting to rebuild itself. A lot of things have returned to normal, which is great for them. 
and especially with someone like Goku around and his ability, they're going to be safe for the near future as well, and the far future. The future warriors don't really encounter any threats at this point either, pretty much like you'd expect just like what happened with Trunks. Although at some point, Shin and Kapito do appear on Earth to try and stop Majin Buu, as well as Bobbidi and Deborah. And surprisingly, the Kai see that Goku's aware that they're going to come to Earth, and he's already ready to join them. They don't even really need to explain anything. Well, they do need to explain some stuff. Goku just knows that they're here to help for something that they're going to face in the future. But Goku tells them, apparently, they win. He tells the Kai's his ability. At least after he learns who they are and that he can trust them. And he did see some other vague things too, but for now, they're going to focus on this threat. So, Boo isn't really too hard to stop, especially since they have more people around. Considering Trunks was actually able to stop Deborah in his tracks, and Bobbity too, obviously, it shouldn't really be too hard when we have a stronger Trunks here, plus two people that are stronger than him alongside him. Shin and Kabuto end up surviving too, which is obviously a pretty big deal, because one of the things Goku did foresee is somebody attacking this timeline, but he doesn't really know who. Strangely enough, it seemed like he saw himself in the vision, but that can't be right. Little does he know, and another timeline, Goku Black is born. But there's a kind of a predicament here. Goku Black obviously does want to attack Trunks' timeline, or I guess future Goku's timeline because he's the main one there. But unlike originally, Shin is still alive, which means Beerus is still alive there. That's going to be a pretty big obstacle, so he knows to obviously just target Shin. He can work around it. I mean, he was able to do it in his timeline, so he'll be able to kill the Kai in that timeline too. Especially once he recruits Zamasu. Goku Black travels to this new timeline. But as he gets to the Sega World of Kai's in Universe 10, he's shocked to see that there's some visitors there. Goasu and Zamasu are there but also future Goku and future Shin. Wait, why is that mortal here? But he realized now, how could he forget? Apparently from what he's heard, that mortal has some sort of ability to see the future. He must have seen this happening, but how? He's not even from this timeline. He shouldn't have seen Goku Black coming here. Future Goku doesn't mess around either, especially with the timeline that he's in. While he still does love fighting, he knows not to take any risk here. He doesn't know what this threat is capable of, especially because it's him. He still doesn't really know who Goku Black is, but from what he remembered, he saw Goku Black teaming up with Zamasu. Once he told Shin and Kibito this, they were able to figure out that he was talking about Zamasu. Goku didn't know who the guy was, but he described the Kai, and Shin was able to point it out pretty easily. And they got here around the time that Goku suspected Goku Black would show up. And during the fight, Goku Black noticed that Goku is actually pretty confident. He doesn't know why that is. He could tell Goku doesn't really know what's going on, but Goku says he doesn't really mind. He knows they'll win here. He already foresaw it. That's why they're here. He came here to stop this. The whole reason he had that vision is because in that vision, he was present here. He knew to come here. He knew he would come here and stop whatever is about to happen from happening. It's pretty much one of those self-fulfilling prophecies again. Goku Black tries to tap into that same ability. But of course, he doesn't know the first thing about it, or even if he can do it. He can maybe use it during the fight, but that's not going to happen. Hell, he can't even transform, but Goku can. And Goku Black promises he'll kill Goku in this timeline like he did with that other Goku, and Zamasu. He knows that deep down he wants to join. He'll get Zamasu to come onto his side. They are one of the same after all. Zamasu has no clue of what he's talking about. Goku Black has no time to explain because he's too preoccupied fighting Goku. And it's a pretty tough battle. But there are a few big things in Goku's favor. For one, with Zamasu seeing this world under threat and not having any connection to Goku Black yet, he surprisingly decides to help here too. Which is good because he could heal Goku. As an apprentice Kai with that ability, he'll be able to restore Goku if he needs. But that doesn't really happen at first. Goku paces himself, eventually going to Super Saiyan 2, and then getting ready to end this as quickly as possible. He transforms once more. Showing off his new strongest power, Super Saiyan 3. Zamasu can't believe what he's seeing, a mortal growing that strong. But that other Goku, he can sense divine key in him. A very familiar divine key. Zamasu is conflicted, and while he harbors these thoughts against mortals, he hasn't fully turned evil yet. And on a whim, he heals Goku, restoring him to his full strength while in Super Saiyan 3. And with that, he's able to defeat Goku Black with ease. Goku Black does have the body of a stronger Goku, because the Goku's body that he stole is one that trained longer. But at the same time, he has no practice with it. The only practice he has is killing everyone in his universe, in his timeline. He's not as practiced as the Goku Black we saw once he first encountered Goku. So, with future Goku having Super Saiyan 3, it's pretty overkill. And once again, this timeline is saved. This time, before it even happens. Although, there is something else that future Goku foresaw. A meeting with the God of Destruction of his universe, Beerus. Although, future Goku does find it pretty strange. They still don't know who Goku Black is, but how did he come to be? Goku Black said he killed Goku in another timeline. But how did that Goku not foresee it? But then he realizes, was it the one that he went to the past to save? Because he focused more on short-term stuff than long-term visions. Maybe he wasn't actively looking for a threat. He's not too sure, and maybe he'll never know. Yeah, I know this is probably getting very confusing with all these Gokus and all the timeline stuff, just like the actual series, so it's staying faithful at least. But yeah, the third other Goku, the one that Goku Black killed, he actually didn't foresee that coming. And while future Goku is excited to meet Beerus, he decides to take a brief detour, going back to the past, Samurai Jack meeting his present self again, the main Goku that we know here. 
After trying to explain it, even though it's very confusing, Goku kind of sees what's going on. And then he tries to actively seek what's happening. And yep, he sees himself fighting himself. And he's green for some reason. But again, they still don't know how Goku Black came to be or how to stop him. But future Goku tells him Zamas was involved somehow, so just watch out for him here. Oh, well, that's good. And he thanks future Goku for coming back here and decides to give him a tip too. If Beerus is still around in this timeline, he shows off Super Saiyan God, giving him a little bit of a head start too. The future Goku thanks his present self. It seems this trip back was pretty beneficial, even though it was pretty short, because now the future timeline is safe and the present timeline is safe. That third timeline though, didn't really get so lucky. And Goku glad that his future self came back and helped them again, even though he still can't really wrap his head around what's going on, but whatever, he'll leave that timeline stuff up to the Kais. Zamasu never gets the Super Dragon Balls in this timeline, and Goku Black never comes to be in this timeline either. Which is good, because now we get to see how strong Goku actually is. And what Goku Black would have had access to, had he actually practiced with his body. After they stop all the Zamasu stuff, Goku's back on Beerus' planet once more, with Raditz there too. Beerus knows he has some sort of similar abilities, and maybe he could be a pretty useful training partner for Goku. But at the same time, Beerus doesn't even know if Goku really needs it, because now, he has something truly amazing. With all this practice, he's starting to use something that kind of reminds Beerus of Ultra Instinct. Amidst their fights, Goku's foresight allows him to predict moves, pretty accurately at that. But it's still not subconscious. He needs to push Goku to that level. And during this sparring match, he might finally be able to push Goku towards doing this. With all of Whis's teachings in mind, and the pressure of fighting Beerus, Goku's finally able to tap into it, using these visions subconsciously, and having his body move subconsciously alongside it. He taps into Ultra Instinct, first being Omen, and he has a surprisingly good grasp on it. The power of it does seem a little bit draining, but unlike the first time he unlocked it in the Tournament of Power in the main story, he seems to have better control here, and he can actually attack with it too. And they spar for a brief while. It only ends because Goku gets tired out, he doesn't lose the form, and that's how Beerus knows they're on the right track. And Raditz is intrigued by this too. He can't believe his brother got this far ahead. He needs to catch up quick. Maybe he should have focused on those short-term things instead. Although he does brag to Goku. He was the first one to foresee Zamasu. Goku tells him it apparently wasn't soon enough because they're both dead in another timeline. Oh, kind of a bummer. But Raditz promises his brother. He'll tap into the same power soon, and he promises it to Beerus too. In case you couldn't tell, things are pretty chill right now, for lack of a better word. Besides Zamasu, there's not really any threats. Everyone is just continuing their normal lives. Nappa's back on Earth too, once more training with Gohan. And with the abilities he learned with Raditz, it's pretty useful in battle. Beerus kind of ignores the other Saiyans. He's really only focused on Goku, and allowed Raditz to come here because he had that similar ability, so maybe he can unlock Ultra Instinct too. But he still doesn't really know yet. Although, he's glad that Goku already has it. Especially this early on. This is when the Goku Black arc would have happened. Goku at this point is already far stronger than he was in the main story. And on top of that, he now has UI Omen, so... Yeah, you could probably see where this is going once we get to the Tournament of Power. That still does happen, and in terms of the team, it is a little bit strange. We got Goku, Gohan, Raditz, Vegeta, and Nappa, Krillin, Tenshin, Han, Roshi, Yamcha, and Piccolo. And outside of the humans, really, pretty much everyone here is radically different from where they were in the main story. Goku has his foresight. He's still Goku. He's very similar to how he was normally. But he has gone through very different things and has different abilities, and is stronger. Gohan has that motivation from his future self, and his father too. Also being a training partner with Vegeta, Vegeta doesn't really have that rivalry with Goku. He's kind of accepted that he won't really catch up, especially because he knows they have some sort of weird abilities. Nappa spilled the beans to him, and he's mainly just surprised they kept it secret for that long. As for Nappa and Raditz, they're alive, so that's obviously different. And Piccolo didn't really go through the same development that he did, and he is kind of a good guy now, but he's more like how Vegeta was during the Cell Saga, for example. So, while this team does have some similarity to the main one, it's still pretty different in its own ways, whether it be some of the different characters being here, or how much some of the characters have changed. And the reason I'm pointing that out is because there's nothing really else to cover with the tournament. To put it in simple terms, it's kind of a wash. Goku might try and give himself a handicap though, try not to use his foresight to win, but by now he already has Ultra Instinct, so he already kind of does that subconsciously. Beerus does tell him to take it serious, and Goku responds by saying he knows they'll win. There's a path to victory. He's already foreseen it. Okay, well, Beerus knows that, but still, take it serious. And Goku says he thinks he could do this without his foresight and truly test Ultra Instinct. Well, in that case, Beerus is kind of up for it. Goku maintains Ultra Instinct pretty much throughout the entire tournament too, mostly using Omen. Also, there's Raditz using a lot of spear control, multiplying himself and using clones to teleport around and save everyone eliminated, so his team doesn't even get eliminated. But there is one opponent who they do kind of need to take seriously, Jiren. Although, it's still not a problem. Goku powers up into Ultra Instinct, the actual Ultra Instinct, not just Omen. The gods look on completely perplexed. Not only was he using Ultra Instinct throughout the entire tournament, but now he has this version of it, like the actual Ultra Instinct. But it's not just him. Raditz powers up as well. Going into Ultra Instinct Omen, surprisingly, the others didn't even know he had this. And he's glad to finally use this against an opponent. He has tried it against Beerus, and he does know he's behind Goku still. But 
he will be able to catch up. He's way behind in terms of power. He had a much later start with Godly Key and Godly Training. But he got Ultra Instinct Omen pretty quickly, even though he's not as practiced with it. The two fight together, not relying on their foresight. They're just using Ultra Instinct as it's meant to be. Which kind of does mean they're relying on their foresight, but they feel like they are following the handicap. And they are able to defeat Jiren together. Universe 7 wins, and the wish is made to restore all the other universes. So, as you kind of expect, we're at a point where the foresight is just completely overpowered. This is why I didn't give him the ability right away, because then there wouldn't really be a story. If Goku could just predict everything and stop it before it happens, yeah, that wouldn't really work too well. But now, here, I mean, there's really no way around it. At this point, they would have it. They have complete control of it, whether that be short-term or long-term. And besides that blunder with that other timeline where Goku Black was able to get Goku's body, they're able to use it perfectly. Future Goku has it too. And his life's going perfectly fine. He's even met Beerus, probably getting Super Saiyan God already, becoming his rival in that timeline too. But back to the main timeline again, what happens next? There's no Broly movie because there's no Frieza either. And unfortunately, there's no reason for Goku or Raditz to actually foresee Broly either because there's no way for him to get involved. So he's stuck on Vampa. As for Moro, that is one thing that they're able to foresee. But again, it's not really a problem, especially when you have Raditz. Maris doesn't even need to intervene. Once Moro escapes, before he even gets to Namek, Raditz decides to intervene himself, using instant transmission, which he really loves using. Although it's kind of a bad thing because he ends up on Moro's ship and now he's in the middle of space, so if this ship explodes, he's kind of screwed. But he still knows he'll win here, and he knows he has to stop this. He grabs onto Moro and teleports to a nearby planet. All right, much safer. He then activates Ultra Instinct once more, and Moro has no idea of what's going on, but by the time he tries to guess what's happening, it's already too late. Raditz has already drained his energy, and he's far too drained to do anything. And Raditz isn't the merciful type. Even though he's a good guy now, he's Raditz. He's a normal Saiyan. And it's best for him to kill Moro anyway, so that's exactly what happens. Huh, that guy wasn't too much of a challenge. He knew he would become a threat eventually, but hey, it's good that he stopped him here. That's the whole reason Raditz learned that long-term foresight anyways, because he wanted to prevent threats from happening. And inadvertently, they're preventing even more threats. There's no Granola arc. The heaters are already gone. Actually, there kind of was already a Granola arc, I guess, when they met Granola before. So besides the heaters being gone, Granola's actually an ally, if anything. Raditz has already been to Serial, and that's all set. And as much as I'd love to have Superhero come into play here too, because I love Superhero, this time we're going to end up skipping that as well. I mean, Goku had to deal with a vision of Cell before. Once he sees another vision of Cell, seeing that he might come back in another form, also being giant, well, he has no clue what this is, but it's probably another Cell. And he does not want that to happen again. He gets Gohan to help him too. And he tells Gohan. He's going to see what he did to the Red Ribbon Army a while ago although this time not as brutal. They infiltrate the Red Ribbon's base, and immediately they're attacked. There's a brand new android, Gamma-1. But it's just Gamma-1. They attack so early and so preemptively that Gamma-2 is not even made yet. He's in the process of being made, and Cell Max is not far along at all. Although, they don't even kill anyone. They're able to easily just knock out all the soldiers, holding off Gamma-1 as they're also able to destroy Cell Max before he's fully made, with Dr. Hato watching in disbelief as his whole creation goes down in flames. But Jenjin and Karma are not really too happy either. Although, Hato's happy that at least Gamma 1's still here, and Gamma 2's almost done, so maybe there's a shot. Well, not really. Although, luckily, things turn out pretty well for him. This time, Goku's not just gonna completely obliterate the Red Ribbon Army. I mean, he's surprised that they're even still around. But Hato takes it upon himself to stop them once he realizes that if he and Gamma 1 want to be superheroes, they can't be with the Red Ribbon Army. So, this ends pretty nicely, and by the time Gamma 2 is actually awakened, Hato's already had a change of heart. So, the Gammas are still around. Cell Max has stopped, and the Red Ribbon Army stopped. So that wraps up everything pretty nicely. But that doesn't mean Goku's gonna stop trying to surpass himself. Yeah, he's strong, and everyone around him is too. Although he's pretty far above everyone, Raditz is catching up though. Even with no threats around them, that's a good thing. They could focus completely on training, focus on getting stronger. And Beerus is glad his prophecy came true, the prophecy of him finding a rival. Although it's even better because not only is there one, there's two, and they're both using Ultra Instinct. This is so much better than what he ever expected. And funnily enough, it's not even just his prophecy. Goku was the one to foresee it too. Goku and Beerus, they were destined to meet, destined to be rivals. And now, I guess Raditz is part of that too. Once again, they created a new destiny for themselves, shaping it, changing the future. This time without any ill effects. Well, besides the Zamasu thing, but luckily, they had another version of Goku come from another timeline to help them with that. And even then, in that one rare instance where their foresight didn't work in their favor, it still was a good learning experience. Vegeta and Nappa are still kind of in disbelief at how strong these two are. Those low-class warriors, especially Raditz, the Saiyan that they fought alongside for so long, he kept that secret forever. They never realized how truly potent his strength was, or rather, that ability, and the fact that Kakarot had the same thing. But they're not done either. Nappa knows as an elite Saiyan, he needs to keep up. And same for Vegeta, he is the prince after all. Those low-class warriors may have their fancy abilities, but these two, they will rise to the top of it. Even though they do have a long way to go, catching up with Ultra Instinct and all. Gohan finds this admirable too. But still, glad that he was able to grow so fast, even without that ability. 
Beerus lays back on his planet, relaxed. He and Whis watch as Goku and Raditz spar. Raditz tells Goku he will tap into Ultra Instinct, the complete version of it. He's already on track to doing that, and Goku's more than glad to help, keeping up the same rivalry that they had. And once again, like many times before, he sticks out a hand to Raditz, telling his brother they'll agree to work together once more, surpassing themselves, this time with a much more obtainable goal. And Raditz looks at Goku with a smile, shaking his hand again. He would have never expected his weak little brother to be this strong. And it looks like their father got his wish after all. And then some. Kakarot and Raditz have thrived, and they're still thriving. Now, thriving in the realm of gods. And this is where our story ends. What'd you guys think about the scenario? I know this part went at a breakneck speed, but really, not much would happen with those arcs. But hopefully with all the stuff I added, I was able to make it more enjoyable. This scenario was pretty fun to cover, and I hope you guys enjoyed it too. As usual, if you liked the video, be sure to drop a like, and subscribe if you haven't already. It shows me you want to see more like this, and it does really help out the channel. Anyways, thank you all for watching, thanks for supporting the scenario all the way through, and I'll see you all in my next video.